Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the host of Government Matters and our MC for the day, Mr. Francis Rose. Morning, everybody. It's nice to see all of you here. I'm just moving this out because they gave me one of these. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and St. Louis University for inviting me to be a part of this. I had the distinct privilege of visiting the NGA headquarters campus in DC about a little bit over a year ago and learned a lot about what the organization does, the challenges that the entire intelligence community is up against in at then 2018, now 2019, and uh, turned that into a television show that uh, aired in Washington, D.C. as part of our daily program and aired on the American Forces Network all over the world. Um, and that's archived, by the way, shameless plug, at govmatters.tv. We're on six days a week in the Washington, D.C. area and also on AFN. One of the things that I learned is that this area of intelligence is in a tremendous flux, and you'll learn about that today. You'll also learn in a moment about the flux in, that this city is undertaking, and I'm looking forward to that. A few bits of housekeeping to, uh, to share with you. Uh, we'll have the information on the screen. There it is for uh, the Wi-Fi, if you want to get on the Wi-Fi today and use that. Um, the most important part of the day, with all due respect to the speakers, um, for most of the attendees, the most important part of the day is lunch. And lunch is available, uh, I'm told, in both the lobby area and the courtyard outside. The weather's terrific, and so there'll be an opportunity to enjoy lunch outside. Um, one of the things that I have committed to do, thanks to this wonderful invitation, is to keep everything running on time. And so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the folks who will be here for that discussion about the future of St. Louis. Uh, your moderator is Kristen Robertson, the Vice President for Auto Autonomous Systems at Boeing and she'll be speaking to the director of NGA, Vice Admiral Robert Sharp, and the president of St. Louis University, Fred Pestello. Please make them welcome. Good morning, everybody. I, I would say the most important thing besides lunch, did everybody have a good breakfast? <laughs> well, well, hey, we started our evening last night with a pre-reception, and I have to say, uh, Fred, it was just a wonderful time, Vice Admiral, and have the governor, the mayor, uh, Vinton Cerf from Google, uh, chief architect and evangelist of the internet, I think, right? Uh, he had a wonderful story about that, but uh, very, very inspiring evening with everything that's going on in St. Louis with Arch to the Park, the investment, and the renaissance. And I'm just really excited to be moderating this panel and to, uh, to have you share some of your vision, goals, and objectives around uh, the future of St. Louis in this space. So with that, um, we'll maybe start out and, uh, you know, it's a perfect place when we think about uh, the gateway uh, to the west, right, with St. Louis. Admiral, we're, we're great. You're here, your team. Um, but what a better place than the gateway of innovation. So this morning we have two leaders with us uh, that represent uh, organizations that have a heritage of leaning into big challenges and finding solutions. NGA and SLU have a knack for mapping the future, no pun intended, and we're eager to hear about that and, and what those next steps are. So I'll start out, um, Vice Admiral, with you first. And I recently had the opportunity to hear you, hear you speak at uh, Ben's, and uh, we were talking about diversity and uh, talent. Uh, when we think about the, uh, the agency's mission, which I remember you saying, show the way by knowing the earth. So as NGA's seventh director and fairly new on the job, how do you see that mission evolving, if any, 
and, and how will that impact the geospatial ecosystem, uh, specifically here in St. Louis? That's a, that's a great question and a great topic for us to kick off with here. And just so I can clarify, you know, our, our mission, um, we produce and deliver um, trusted geospatial intelligence um, so that policymakers can make decisions, so that warfighters can do what they need to do, so that first responders um, can do what they need to do. Um, we like to say that we exist to show the way. You know, so if you take anything away from here, when you think of NGA, think show the way. And we do so, as you said, by knowing the earth, you know, the, the physical science of the earth and its characteristics, and then by layering information on top of that foundational understanding, uh, understanding the world. So we show the way by knowing the earth and understanding the world. Um, I inherited a really good strategy from the former director. It really resonated with me. It has uh, four simple uh, strategic goals, and I simplify them even further. It's about people, partnerships, delivering trusted geo went where and when needed today to conduct mission, and then thinking about the future and evolving because the world's changing around us. And uh, I couldn't be more excited about what we're doing here in St. Louis, you know, and it starts with those people and partnerships. And, you know, a great example is the partnership we have with St. Louis University. We have a great uh, cooperative research and development agreement that we've signed with St. Louis University. We're looking at also signing one with University of Missouri and Washington University. And we're excited about tapping into the great minds you have here to do cooperative research and development, looking at emerging technologies, you know, things like small sensors on unmanned systems, remote sensing, right, uh, geodetic surveys. Um, that's our strength as a nation, is our people, our partnerships. Um, I think most people are tracking that we are, we are uh, building out here. So we have a, an exciting uh, N new NGA West construction um, and we have the authorities now to move forward with the, the contracting. Um, I saw the designs yesterday. It's amazing. Um, it's, it's really designed so that we evolve our partnering with academia and industry in new and exciting ways. So I gotta tell you, uh, the men and women of National Geospatial Intelligence Agency are really excited about what we have going on here in St. Louis. We think it's game changing, not only for our agency, um, but for the broader GeoInt community, um, the intelligence community. And I think we are not only showing the way, but leading the way on how public and private partnerships need to evolve for our nation. Thank you, Admiral. And people, partnerships, trusted information. And speaking of partnerships, President Pistello, could you tell us a little bit about GeoSLU initiative, how it got started, some of the goals, and uh, how we can leverage that with current geospatial capabilities? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. And first, let me say what a pleasure it is to be up here with both of you. Uh, Ms. Robertson uh, has had, obviously, a very distinguished career with Boeing, but also is a, a trustee at, here at St. Louis University. We appreciate all you do to support us. And Vice Admiral, uh, your career has led you to this incredibly impressive uh, appointment. We're so pleased to have you in the position and as a partner now with us in so much that's happening in the region. And welcome to all of you. Uh, as President, I can't let uh, you all be here without uh, offering a welcome on behalf of St. Louis University. Uh, we are one of the 28 Jesuit colleges and universities uh, in the United States the second oldest, the oldest university west of the Mississippi River. We are the oldest continuing organization in the St. Louis region with St. Louis U High. So there's a lot of history here. And that leads into the answer uh, to your question. So when I became president of St. Louis University five years ago, one of the things that we did was we developed a strategic plan. And in that process, which was bottom up, we said research and scholarship needs to be given greater prominence and priority. And of course, then as we committed to um, supporting research and scholarship, we said we have to identify areas of focus. So we went through a process to identify, and this is from the bottom up, this came from our faculty, where do we want to make a mark? 
and geo slew emerged out of that process. We have faculty, have had faculty, working for years in areas related to this. And they came together across a range of disciplines, looking at everything from water and sediment to diseases and how they move, to tracking crime, inequality. So across a variety of fields, our scholars came together in an organic way to say, this needs to be a priority for us. And so we are collaborating internally, but also externally. And as uh, Vice Admiral Sharp said, this is a collaborative effort between the NGA and the academy, the NGA and industry, between us and other universities, between us and the NGA and uh, other organizations. And we've had models of that in our community for some time, uh, first of which is perhaps the Cortex Innovation Center, where universities, industry, um, government partners come together to advance and apply knowledge. And as part of that, it's the education of the next generation so that we can have the talent we need to continue to develop and advance in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. So as technology and the, the pace of change, and you talked about the, the collaboration and how you, how you came up with those ideas, but it, with the pace of change and that evolution, what do you think the key ingredients are in terms of skills required to contribute in the future? And are you seeing natural areas where we can partner together? And you hit on a little bit of that collaboration, both of you. I would ask uh, your thoughts on that to really prepare the, the future workforce. So maybe, um, Fred, if you wouldn't mind going first. No, I'd be, be happy to. So, I mean, obviously it starts with um, developing great critical thinkers. Um, and that is foundational. So it starts pre-K all the way up through elementary school, junior high, high school, and certainly then into uh, our colleges and universities. And it is to educate people who not only have the competence, but also the character, people that we can count on uh, in our workforce uh, to do the right thing, to help advance uh, knowledge. So it starts with a foundation of educational excellence and rigor. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, it goes back to our strength um, being, as a nation, really being uh, our our people and our partnerships. You know, and uh, when you look at the strategic environment, strategic competition we we have, we're in. You know, I I sleep well at night knowing that we have the people that we have in this nation, the partnership, and um, at National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, we're really trying to evolve how we interact and reach out to the next generation. Um, and I, I mentioned the partnering with the university, but we need, to, we need to start partnering much earlier. So just like you were saying, getting in from kindergarten um, through high school. And we at, uh, at NGA, we have a, a program called uh, Partners in Education where our workforce is reaching out to the community in, in some pretty spectacular ways reaching out with some speaking series, um, tutoring, um, getting kids excited about robotics, getting them excited about geology, um, geospatial intelligence, geospatial sciences. Um, and, and I think you know, that's so critical to really evolving our, our uh, community here and our nation to address the challenges that are, are on the horizon. Thank you both. That was great. I mean, people are our strength, and as we talked this morning before the big meeting, I mean, that is really going to be our competitive differentiator going forward. So appreciate you highlighting that. That pipeline is so key. So uh, President Pastello, you know, your career in 25 years in leadership positions, partnering uh, at the University of Dayton with um, the government, whether AFRL or industry, how does that experience help you and help the efforts here uh, with St. Louis University and in the region? Yeah, certainly I think the background uh, I brought with me when I came to St. Louis University five years ago is very important and has helped shape some of my thinking for leading here at SLU. Uh, at the University of Dayton specifically, where I spent 25 years, uh, Dayton had begun in the 1950s in the uh, post-war period to work very closely and collaboratively with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, 
which is the largest single site employer in the state of Ohio. They have AFRL there, the Air Force uh, Labs, and so there's a tremendous amount of research that takes place. And Dayton was not alone. We worked with other universities uh, as well within the state to collaborate with uh, the Air Force, and so uh, Dayton does a tremendous amount, uh, well over $100 million in sponsored research and engineering uh, in collaboration with the base and academic partners, and uh, that comes largely through the Department of Defense. It allows us to attract faculty we couldn't otherwise attract because we have access to the labs and the equipment, which is incredibly expensive. It allows that collaboration to also be attractive to scholars um, and researchers who otherwise might not be as attractive without that uh, group of colleagues with which they can work. So I've seen uh, since early in my career the power of that collaboration between the government and the academy working on uh, particular problems so that we can advance and apply knowledge in ways that would otherwise not be possible. If I could build on that too, because uh, we actually have uh, members of National Geospatial Intelligence Agency up in Dayton, Ohio you know, and partnering with the Air Force there. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, it's a great example of the value of, of bringing smart minds together to solve uh, problems creatively. And in the intelligence community, um, we like to say that we are uh, four things. One, um, we're innovative. You know, we're, we try to let people know that we, we are creative in, in solving uh, national security issues for our nation. Um, we're integrated, you know, we work well as a team. It's not individual agencies, it's, you know, our strength comes from combining our capabilities. We're partnered, um, which is what I'm really excited about, what we have going on here in St. Louis, and we're transparent. Um, you know, we welcome oversight. Uh, we'll tell you what we do know and what we don't know, and we won't be shy about uh, speaking the truth to power. Thank you both. That was super. So, you know, as you look at the agenda today, we have a, a number of topics that cover the different applications. And regarding the ecosystem, would you mind sharing, and I think, um, Dr. Pacello, you hit on uh, a couple of those ideas in your opening question that I asked you around how the larger team can uh, increase their knowledge in this space and, and how that might help improve the quality of life. And I would ask uh, both of you uh, the same question. Go ahead. So uh, once again, we're really excited about what we have go coming on here as an agency. And um, for those, you know, you're talking about the, um, the excitement from this city, just to, to remind people, I mean, we've, we've been here in this city for decades. You know, so we, we have deep roots here as part of this community. Um, the, the men and women of, of National Geospatial Intelligence Agency are citizens of, of St. Louis, um, of this state, of the surrounding region. You know, so they're really excited about, uh, about what we're doing here. Um, they, they bring uh, with them a long uh, history and tradition of geospatial um, excellence. Um, and what we, we uh, revealed in the design yesterday, once, I, once again, I think it's not only showing the way, but leading the way. Um, the way we're designing this construction is focused on really evolving the way we interact with uh, industry and academia. So it's gonna have some deliberate unclassified spaces where we can come together um, in a lab environment or just in uh, classroom environments to talk about uh, evol you know, emerging technologies about uh, new applications, uh, exploring ways that applications have more than one use out there. You know, once again, our, our strength is our people and our partnerships, and I think this is going to be a game changer for us. Uh, I think the Vice Admiral's being a little modest uh, here. Uh, certainly, NGA has been an important part of this community for a long time. but you're literally undergoing a transformation that I think is going to continue to accelerate the growth and dynamism of our region. Uh, as many of you may know, there's $8 billion of investment taking place in St. Louis right now. Uh, just in this midtown area, well over a $1 billion. Uh, we're seeing the area transform and we're getting incredible press uh, for it, including last week the full page in the New York Times talking about what you could do in 36 hours in St. Louis and it barely scratched the surface. And so it's everything from the entertainment and the culture and the food scene certainly, but the growth in jobs and leading the nation in certain areas and the NGA is essential to that. The largest 
project in those uh, in that $8 billion is the $1.7 billion of the NGA and that change of mindset that you just heard the Vice Admiral talk about to be more integrated and partnering with others, to allow a greater portion of what they do to be non-classified and open uh, to working with others, and certainly St. Louis University and Washington University, the University of Missouri, the University of Missouri St. Louis, and others are eager uh, to partner with them. And so I think you're going to see through the um, deepening of these partnerships with the academy, with government, with business, an acceleration uh, of the knowledge, its application, and the growth of this economy. Uh, we're talking about, I think, 10,000 jobs directly related to the NGA and organizations as part of that, total probably almost 27,000 when you get the complete ripple effects. That's an enormous uh, impact on our economy and something for which we're deeply grateful for your leadership and that of your colleagues. If I, if I can build on that, because he's getting me excited. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, as you're saying, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I was talking about what we're building and, and how excited we are about the, uh, the way we can evolve, the way we interact with academia and industry. But I tell you, um, our workforce is also very excited and appreciative of all the uh, surrounding investment that's going in. You know, because we talk about our strength being our people. Um, this is also a team sport for us. It's not only our, our members that come to work every day at National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uniformed, officer, enlisted, active reserve, our tremendous talent we have in our civilian cadre, our contractors, um, but it's, it's their families as well. And uh, the, you know, everything that's coming on here in St. Louis to really make this uh, an attractive area for, for families to, to live and to raise of uh, their children um, is something that our workforce is tremendously excited about. And, and uh, we're just really appreciative of everybody who's pitching in here to make this transfer transformational. We appreciate so much, you know, the, this renaissance that we're feeling, this economic boom, bringing that to the area. So, you know, if you were to say to the crowd, how can they get involved and how can they do more? We talked about people, partnerships, this trust and this collaboration. How do they get involved? How can we get more involved in the mission? So I'm, I'm going to start by, start by spotting, assessing, recruiting. Um, for all you university students, uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency is a great place to work. Um, and I got to tell you that uh, we al you'll also interact with some uh, leaders in industry around here right now who are, are very excited about what's coming up here in St. Louis. And they are also going to be uh, shamelessly spotting, assessing, and recruiting uh, here where, where and, and you don't have to, you don't have to be a university student uh, to be doing this because you can always change your career and your career aspirations. So uh, my challenge to everybody here today is to, um, to make value out of your time vested here today. Get around to the venues. I challenge you to meet somebody you haven't met before. Um, I challenge you to exchange contact data. I challenge you to stay in contact with those individuals because uh, this group that, that's here, um, once again, it's our people and our partnerships. You are our people and our partnerships. So be polite, be participatory today. Thank you. Fred? And yes, so uh, one of the primary purposes for today was to uh, bring students from the region together here to learn more about the NGA and the opportunities that exist there. So I, that's what I think is particularly exciting and one of the key ways uh, that we can uh, get involved more deeply in the future is building that talent pipeline and providing the talent for these opportunities. And I'll, I'll uh, start by saying, if members from National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, will you please rise? So for all of you not standing, those are your targets. Um, go, go meet our people, because um, they're excited to be here and they're excited to meet you. We are so excited to support your mission, sir. And we appreciate so much your time and sharing where you're going, the vision. It's very, very exciting. You know, as the Boeing company, we're glad to be part of it and to support it. It gives us um, a tremendous amount of pride as we connect, protect, explore, and inspire the world. We're a big consumer of your data. 
whether that's in the defense space or in our commercial space. So we are very appreciative of your support of the mission. So thank you very much. I, I think we probably have, uh, I, I'm not sure if there's any questions, if any questions came in, or if we want to, we have probably uh, six, seven minutes. We could open it up. If there are any questions for Vice Admiral or uh, President Pistello regarding what you heard. If not, I'll give myself one. And, uh, uh, you know, I was thinking about uh, what we just set up there, which was really talking about the future and the excitement. What we didn't necessarily talk about was some of the challenges that we're facing. And, uh, you know, why I'm so excited about people and partnerships and why this is so necessary for us. I think uh, some of the challenges that we're facing, um, certainly as an agency, is, is uh, a lot of data coming to, towards us in the future. You know, there's a, um, the amount of data that we are, are looking that's available to help us know the earth and understand the world is going to force us to really evolve the way that we do our business. Um, and that's, you're going to hear some about that in some of the different panels, you know, and really thinking through how we leverage uh, machines um, to do what machines do best. Um, so that our, our pride possession, our people, our critical thinkers, um, can focus, you know, not being swarmed by too much information to do the critical thinking that they need to do. I think that's one of the big challenges we're going to be facing today, and I think it's going to be um, resonating in some of the discussions you're seeing here today. And to build upon that, so one of the things that's particularly exciting within the academy is that uh, at heart the academy is a community of scholars. And these are individuals who have devoted their lives to advancing, to mastering and then advancing fields of study. And scholars thirst for tools to do that at an accelerated rate, to be able to take the things, the questions to which they have committed their lives and to develop answers. And with the techniques that we're seeing coming available, with the data that we are now seeing available, with the tools that we are getting from the NGA and related fields. It will allow us to continue to accelerate knowledge overall with the goal of improving the human condition in so many ways. I mean, one of the things that we're looking at here is the Zika virus. And, you know, this sort of data is absolutely essential to tracking those sorts of things. So how we're keenly interested in what is coming out in terms of the tools, learning how to be more intelligent every day in addressing the fundamental problems that humankind faces as we advance. Yeah, those are, those are excellent points. There are so many applications that we can think about, and we talked about some initially other applications. It is a very, very exciting time. Let's give uh, Vice Admiral and President Pistello a huge round of applause and thank them for what they do. <laughs> what they do for St. Louis. We appreciate it so much. Appreciate your time. And then, um, Mr. Rose, uh, I will hand it back to you. So thank you. It was uh, pretty easy to see as I made my way to Sugar Fire last night, quick plug, uh, for barbecue. Yeah, was that a good choice? Thanks, Admiral. Um, I understand that's not an endorsement, just an encouragement, right? All right. Um, but it was easy to see that uh, St. Louis is growing and uh, becoming an even more vibrant place than it's already been, so it was terrific to hear uh, that conversation about the vision academically and professionally about where the city's headed. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce now uh, a woman with a very distinguished and accomplished career that you can read more about in your program. Uh, Dr. Annette Sobel is now senior advisor to St. Louis University and is here to present the morning keynote. Well, good morning, everyone. And so my first challenge 
to those students out in the crowd, because I am a teacher, is St. Louis is clearly the center of the universe. And I challenge you all in the geospatial community to disprove it. My husband's a physicist, and he always has this discussion with me. I say, well, disprove it. <laughs> it's so exciting to be here, and I am delighted to talk to you about what I see as the great opportunities here in St. Louis in the geospatial domain. Look at where we are as a planet. Four 10 to the 21 bytes of digital content globally. That's zettabytes. Now, if you look at the global GDP, 25 trillion US dollars. Look at all the overlap, potentially, with geospatial information when it comes to opportunities to further explore and research this domain. By 2022, up to 300 billion network devices are estimated. Eight billion humans will live on the Earth. And seven billion humans online, more than 85% of the world. And 96 zettabytes of digital content. Every human, every animal, every living being to include plants, agriculture, is part of all seeing and knowing. What we need more than ever, and as was emphasized in the prior panel discussion, is we need knowledgeable and informed analysts to address our world's emerging needs, challenges, and threats, which are ubiquitous. Let's think about this. One perspective from a man I admire greatly, Bill Gates, has published his 10 grand challenges. So let's think as a community about how these grand challenges interface with geospatial information. Every one of them, I would posit to you, has a geospatial nexus. When we think about carbon sequestration, energy storage, universal vaccines and potentially targeted delivery of those vaccines, dementia mitigation and finding and prioritizing populations at need, at need, ocean decontamination, energy efficient desalination, earthquake prediction, on and on, safe driverless cars, embodied artificial intelligence, and even decoding the brain. One of the biggest challenges we have is to understand the significant interdependencies of our geospatial ecosystem when it comes to the distributed and potentially fully autonomous platforms, to the mission enabling information, and I'm using a military algorithm here that for many of you may not know or be familiar with, but acronyms are the basis of information and some of our greatest pillars in the defense community. So we think about the interactions, not the stovepipes of information in diplomacy and diplomatic interactions, military, informational, economic, and environmental segments of information. Here we go. What we're really, our great goals here for this century, and as we move toward the mission to Mars and manned um, and other applications for geospatial information, we have a great opportunity ahead of us to require improvement of the scientific method and utilization within social dynamics, economics, health, natural resources, and everything involves geospatial information. As we start thinking about the business component of geospatial, I work a lot with students to encourage them not only to become knowledgeable, pick an area, 
any area that you're passionate about and become knowledgeable. And then think about how you can innovate around that area. Let's start pulling in geospatial information into those innovations that these students are doing. And I'm talking about students K through 12. Heck, you know, I'm a physician as well as an engineer. I think we should start prenatally with these kids. Opportunities to connect and innovate. That's what we're all about here. We're looking for most of the economics that does not use the scientific method and start applying and integrating and making deep analytics part of what we do every day. And not only to better understand and predict, but work in situ in the environment in which humans function. So the emergence of geospatial information, I'm gonna quote one of, I think, the world's greatest leaders to date. FDR, while it may be difficult to prepare the future for our children, we can prepare our children for the future. And knowledge acquisition and knowing how to purposely use that knowledge is one of the greatest gifts we can give to our children and to future generations. So let's start with understanding the surveillance, the age of surveillance capitalism. Great book. I use it in my classes. How can applied research in geospatial domains really better be used to inform societies and decision makers at every level? When you're talking about government, non-government, academics, everyone throughout the business community. Knowledge is not just the understanding of information, but is the path ahead, the way ahead to being bold, brave, and benevolent in its application. In my 24 years in the military and as a two-star general, I saw many ways that information could be applied on both sides of the aisle. And now I'm seeing a broader perspective on how, in many ways, the Defense Department partnering with the civilian agencies and many other interagency partnerships that still remain to be explored create opportunity for benevolent application. Our future pathway depends on it. And public-private partnerships, as were referred to already many times, really also understand and relate to the importance of a knowledge-based economy. And that's what we're looking at here in St. Louis and its geospatial domain. So as we start thinking ahead as to ways that students and other educators in partnership with analysts and city planners and those who make decisions about prioritization of resources, whether it be in a disaster, in a low intensity conflict, whether it be in a huge business decision in which many billions of dollars of IP are being traded, we think about many types of research questions that may be applied and solutions. Can geospatial tools, including AI, be customized to provide time-critical decision assistance to serve the needs of business and society as a whole? One enormous area for consideration. Also, can we think about other huge challenges, such as can geospatial information accurately predict and forecast the complexity and those elements that are key within catastrophic events. So that instead of always responding to a catastrophic event, we can pre-plan and pre-position assets and resources that engage geospatial information. Can geospatially fuse data forecast potentially reversible societal shifts? and thus avert chaos in terms of utilization of very scarce resources such as agricultural resources, such as potable water, and hence avoid future instabilities that result in chaotic situations. Analytic challenges in our information domain environment are what we're all thinking about in terms of the future research opportunities. 
How do we extrapolate information from a non-contextual data environment and understand where the biases are occurring so that when we make predictions, when we make critical decisions that affect the warfighter and the operational communities, we understand what the biases are that are impacting our decision making. We have, as been expressed a number of times, a digital tsunami of data that is undermining expertise. Understand where the data and the misinformation is coming from. Validate, validate, validate your sources of information. When I ran the Information Fusion Center uh, as the J2 for National Guard Bureau, I always said, what is your hypothesis? What are your data sources? Show me how you validated, not only once, but multiple times, your sources of data. Critically important. But also, how do we continue to take this high-tech exploration and charting of the future to retain its most important asset, which is its power due to diversity, due to human capability and capacity. Diversity augments the, ag the every analyst's capability for success through a widened search space and application of tools that can bring to you a more robust set of solutions and courses of action. Additional research shows enhanced performance from interprofessional teams. The whole technique of greenfielding in an unclassified space brings those composite teams together with a continu continuum of potentially polarized information and dialogue. This process of red teaming or black hatting creates a stronger community of diverse opinions and potential solution sets for analysis and action. Analytic situation awareness is enhanced through enhanced human-centered design of fused data. And so as we think about geospatial information and how it enhances the power of diversity, I like thinking like an engineer which is you have multiple individuals or multiple sets with varying perspectives expanding the search space employed. And the result is a diverse crowd, more tools to apply, more perspectives to view the solution sets from, and you have a more robust toolbox ultimately that can be applied to solving your problem sets. In summary, this is our home. We are 3.7 billion miles away. If you look at information as a tiny dot, a pale blue dot, the sunlight reflected from the Earth took five and a half hours to reach the Voyager 1 back in 1990. You think about this, about whole holistically thinking about how geospatial information can be employed to solve not only our nation's problems, but globally the problem sets that we will continue to face in the future. As Carl Sagan put it in 1994, look again at that dot. That's here, that's our home, and that's the domain in which all of us can contribute to this universe. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions, and particularly if there are students out here, I would love to ha try and answer your questions. We're all students. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. Oh, we have a question. Okay. Okay, please identify yourself. 
Okay, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm an intelligence analyst by training and I always think, what's the ground truth? No matter how smart, how advanced an AI system will be, you still need to have a ground truth to compare your results to. I worked uh, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for several years in, I would say, an analogous problem set, which is developing automatic target recognition systems for looking at massive data sets and imagery and selecting features and also extracting information that would be of value for whatever operational need was at hand. And we had a similar problem set because we built huge volumes and libraries of data and we had to really determine what was ground truth, what was anomalous, where, how do we extract the signal from the noise? It's always about signal to noise. So in the AI world, I would say, trust but verify. That is what I use as my mantra even to today. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Comparing the uh, the stage, uh, the status of the internet in the 1980s and how it revolutionized how we function, I was wondering, ex extrapolating from the uh, the trends that you just outlined, by the time the new headquarters opens here, where will this discipline evolve to in terms of how we function in business and society along the the lines of a number of the trends you just uh, highlighted. Well, thank you for your question. And as uh, Dick Fleming always asks very interesting questions with a lot of substance to them, but you've got me at a, a little bit of disadvantage because a lot of people here were not at the cybersecurity conference. I think one of the uh, greatest concerns that I have, and I, can, I have to start my discussion with you by saying whenever you think about a solution, you have to think about the flip side of the response. The internet, as we all know, is a fabulous tool. Um, my greatest concern about the internet is obviously identity theft. I've discussed this before. Um, I think as we add more and more human characteristics to the internet, and also, as uh, Vince Cerf and myself and others were discussing just recently in a teleconference, the concerns about misinformation, you have to think about as the internet grows in its self-learning capabilities, in its humanistic type of capabilities, that there will be also challenges in selecting, as I was getting to earlier, signal to noise. And those of us who use the internet as a tool uh, for analytics and deep analytics, you understand the huge challenge because we're faced not only with a tsunami of data, but we're also faced with a tsunami of counter data. So data that will disrupt our ability to make valid information decisions. So one concern is that we will have a cloud of information. We will also have a cloud of misinformation. How do we sort through and pare down the solution sets so we have an accurate, timely decision in time critical needs that are out there in the field. And I'm not only talking about military or disaster response for civilians, but I'm talking about our whole global economy depends on this. We know that as things like nanobots evolve, that timeliness is so critical for decision making. How do you ensure that the information you have on a nanosecond scale is accurate enough to inform these bots? I don't know. I mean, but certainly as the entire field of quantum computing evolves, I think there will be more 
information there that we can apply to the solution set. We also need to be highly concerned about encryption and de-encryption that will become far more easy to disrupt in the future with quantum computing capability as it evolves. Is everybody ready for a break? Well, I want to thank you all. I want to also encourage any of you who are students. Uh, I've had a very interesting, circuitous career. I started out studying biochemistry and computer science. I ended up going on to this fascinating world of aerospace medicine, diving medicine, and of all things, human factors engineering. I did my master's work in automatic target recognition for synthetic aperture radar, and I ended up where I am today, in the best possible place in my career, which is teaching and working with people who want to build a better world. So thank you all for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a break and we will resume at 9.45. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the host of Government Matters, Mr. Francis Rose. <clears throat> Thanks everybody and I hope you had a good break, had a chance hopefully to step outside and uh, see the beautiful day that we have and anticipate lunch which is coming along. I just realized this is the second time I've mentioned lunch, so I don't know what that says about my priorities. But at any rate, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the first panel discussion, or second panel discussion of the morning. And the topic is the changing patterns of human settlement and mobility. The moderator is Dr. Marie Price, the president of the American Geographical Society, and her panelists include the senior geoint authority for geography and cartography at NGA um, is Elizabeth Lyon. Dr. Ness Sand wow. Now see, I should have known it was all of those people that stood up when Admiral Sharp said, where are the NGA people? And you brought your own cheering section. Of course. Which I need to start doing. Obviously. Because that's a, that's a great gig to have. Um, Dr. Ness Sandoval of St. Louis University. Uh, Dr. Lee Schwartz is the geographer of the State Department. Mm -hmm. You're not just a geographer. That's fantastic. And uh, Dr. Stephen Ward is Senior Director of Geospatial and Weather Sciences at the Climate Corporation. Take it away. Thank you. Good morning, St. Louis. You're looking a little more lively. Getting up and stretching was a good idea. Um, we are very excited to be here, and we have a rocking good panel. Um, and I'm here to remind you that uh, you can download the <coughs> Geo Resolution app, and you can find our panel and you can submit questions to us. And um, I've been instructed to make sure by the, uh, uh, the latter part of the panel to look for those questions. There's also paper cards. So the intention is to um, allow for more exchange with the audience. So take a look at the app or, or fill out a card and uh, we'll try and uh, get your questions. Um, I am a human geographer. Um, and I think the core of what human geographers have long been about is how humans settle, populate, move around, and uh, change uh, the surface of the Earth, um, which has a lot in uh, common with geospatial intelligence. Um, the comments that were made about the workforce and where our future uh, people that will pursue these um, kinds of questions. Um, one of the big changes in geography is um, there's now an AP human geography exam, um, and it is the fastest growing exam uh, in the AP universe. This May, 250,000 high school students will take that exam. <laughs> Woohoo! So this means that um, maybe we're not beginning in the prenatal area or in kindergarten, but at least in high school, students are being introduced to critical geospatial thinking, um, patterns of settlement, uh, countries, political geography questions. And this is uh, very important because for decades, geography has really been hidden 
ignored in the social science area and, and now it's coming back. And um, I know as a my um, day job, as it were, is a professor of geography at George Washington University and um, we have hundreds of students, thousands take our courses, and many of them end up working for organizations like the NGA. So um, geography is a, a bright and robust area with a lot of um, geospatial science embedded in it. So what we decided to do is uh, we have a, a few questions that uh, the committee or the panel has uh, considered. Um, we have a range of backgrounds here. And um, uh, as a way to tease out some of the challenges of uh, a large amount of data that are out there, much of it um, geolocated, and, and how in particular we can better understand cities. As you all know, half the people uh, on the planet now live in cities. Um, cities are really complicated geospatial entities and trying to get uh, data and um, accurate, timely data about people in cities is a huge challenge. And I'll, I'll throw out a couple of examples. Uh, first of all, think of that really controversial country of Canada to our north, uh, the city of Toronto. How many of you have been to Toronto? A few hands, okay. Um, Toronto is about a metropolitan area of four million people. Half of them were born in another country. Half of them, right? Extremely diverse. So we can maybe know who, where people are in the city, but, but who are they and where do they cluster and what is that, how does that influence our understanding of, uh, of Toronto as a place that's integrated and connected with many other places in the world, maybe every other country in the world. And then secondly, in the dynamics of cities is, of course, the daily movements. What's the population of a core of a city at noon versus midnight is very different. So, so um, our panel is going to look particularly at cities and uh, mobility and sustainability. And my first question is to Ness who, Sandoval, who's here from uh, St. Louis University. And um, as we try to understand the human geography of cities uh, to better integrate different sources of information, especially census data with geospatial data, can you share with the group the opportunities and challenges of doing that, both in urban contexts that are rich in data and urban contexts that are poor in data? Yes, so this is a very important question when we think about um, Demogra demographic transitions in cities. Um, we're living in an era where we're generating lots of data, um, and so we're lucky in the United States where we have access to uh, the census data, which allows us to look at what's happening at the state level, at the county level. Within cities, we can look at zip codes, census tracts, block groups and blocks, and so we have very rich data, so this is an opportunity to think about how we understand mobility within cities and across cities. Um, so the challenge, I think, is accuracy. We have data that's being generated at the federal level, at the state and local level, and so thinking about how accurate the data is. The second challenge is about integration. How do we integrate uh, this different data, synthesize it, um, to make information from the data that's useful for policymakers, for industry, for academics? Um, the third, um, area is about cultural. So a lot of organizations kept the data to themselves. And so in this era of thinking about um, trying to understand what's happening is open source, making the data transparent. So part of science is being able to reproduce our findings. And so to reproduce findings, we have to share data. And so there has to be a cultural shift in terms of being able to share data. I think the, the challenge for countries um, that um, are developing is that we don't have very good data, like the United States, where we're constantly doing the American Community Survey and, and Census. So we have to rely on the emerging technologies, remote sensing, to try to get a sense of what's happening in terms of mobility patterns, how people are um, moving from city to city. So we're still in this area trying to get a sense of, can we use remote sensing to get a sense of what poverty looks like in, in emerging cities, um, migration patterns, the impact on food security and water. So those are some of the challenges that um, we have to, to think about as we go forward. Uh, another challenge is uh, real-time uh, data. 
And so I think we're in this era of we expect data to be available immediately. Uh, but oftentimes there's processing time to clean the data to make sure it's accurate. And so this is a challenge in terms of expectations of what people want and the reality of how long it takes data to get processed. So those, I think those are the opportunities and challenges when thinking about the urban context of uh, human geography and demographic transitions happening in, in cities throughout the world. Thank you very much. Uh, Liz, or Elizabeth Lyon, but better known as Liz. Um, from your vantage point as um, the GeoInt Authority for Geography and Cartography, what are the new technologies that can improve our understanding of movement and the mix of people in cities, and while at the same time not uh, compromising concerns about the ethics and, and individual privacy? Okay, so first question. Who here has ever played the game SimCity? Come on, there's gotta be a few folks. I mean, I'm technically a digital native. I went to the library, I played the game SimCity a lot at the library. That was before we had computers in our houses, because I am that old. Okay, SimCity, here's the next question. Do you think we can play it in real life? I really hope that you, this is myth busting, I really hope that you said no in that answer because we can't play SimCity in real life, not yet. So technology is one of those things and the data that underpins how we are going to know more information and the relationship of information. Kind of like when you think about SimCity, how all of a sudden you can see, well, hey, is the city happy because I just put in an awesome pool? Or is the city sad because um, Godzilla just decided to go through and tear down every single building? Um, I mean, those are important questions, especially for us in um, the intelligence community as we're, um, and the defense community as we're looking to really understand what's happening in this world. So um, we at our agency talk a lot about our mission. Um, the good news is, if you forget it, um, just think of KSU. Um, so Kent State or Kansas, if you're from one of those, know the earth, show the way, understand the world, super important. So I'm gonna um, kind of frame a little bit about where technology is going with this. So um, first of all, Dr. Sobel, thank you for um, giving all of the context to this problem that we have right now um, of data coming on. And so let me plant a couple of seeds. So when we're talking about tech, um, there are some concerns and some things that we need to think about when we're building new tech. I could talk about what is going on at Esri, at Boundless, at all the new geospatial companies. Um, normally I have my phone in my hands and I can say because we're all multitasking on our phones, there's all of this new stuff that's coming up. So tech is evolving and it is happening faster than we can think about it. So um, planting seeds, what's important in that? Well, when we're designing tech, think about it as a seed, we need to think about the strategy. What are we trying to do with our technology? And then with that, we need to think about the ethics. Who and why and all of those things, how are they impacted by the technology decisions that we've made? Is there something that's happening behind the scenes? Um, is, is somebody taking that data and reselling it and you didn't know because you didn't read your end user agreements? Always read your end user agreements, folks. Um, third in our technology as it's evolving, because with cities, because I said we can't play SimCity in real life yet, um, we have to allow for emergence. So what does that mean? We have to allow for things that are unknown to become known, and technology can help that. And then lastly, um, design. So how do we design our technology so that it is accessible, so that it has some transparency with it? Because we're going to ask a lot of questions and we're going to want to trust what is happening as well with what's coming through um, the tech because it's going to be asserting new things. So um, real fast at NGA, how do, how do we do tech? Well, the good news is, is Mark Munsell, our chief technology officer, can answer all of those questions during his panel. Um, but um, as the SGA, the Senior Geonet authority. Part of my job is to be disruptive and to challenge a little bit about where our future is going with tech, and not just tech, but our methodologies, our vision, and what we're looking at. So for human geography, one of the things that we realized we needed to do is we needed to go back to the core. And that was really developing, I said our mission was know the earth, show the way, understand the world. 
um, part of that core was developing strong science and methodologies to understand people that's repeatable, that then becomes a business so that we can do that over and over again because our mission is to map the world and to understand the world. So imagine playing SimCity. How do you understand the world? Eight billion people in 2022. How do you do that? So our big focus right now is actually to take some steps back to create some methodologies that everybody can use and put as their underpinnings in text. So that's what we're doing at NGA. Um, we've got some challenges. So I always like to throw out some challenges in tech. So SimCity, space, time, things changing, uncertainty. Um, do you think our spatial data structures can actually allow for that today? Um, we've been in the world of shapefiles. They have 422 file extensions, slight exaggeration associated with the shapefile. Um, but how does, and that's our old standard, and I know we're evolving how, how, how our data works, but um, how, what if we had a new data standard? Of what if we had a new platform that was about space, it was about time, cities, verticality, and then confidence? How do you know, how can you trust, how, how well do you know that what you're seeing is, is actually a representation of all of that? So one of the challenges I would put forward is our tech has to start addressing some aspects of uncertainty. Great, thanks very much, Liz. Um, Dr. Schwartz. Uh, oh, this is a question about open source. And one of the important initiatives of the last decade is the growth of open source mapping to respond to humanitarian needs, but also to allow more people to contribute information about their localities. Uh, from your position as the geographer of the Department of State, what are the advantages of open source citizen mapping, and how do you evaluate and use these sources? Thank you, Marie. I've never played SimCity, but um, I have another question for the crowd here. How many of you have ever, ever participated in a mapathon? Show of hands. All right, well, we'll have to change that. Um, we just hosted a mapathon at the Department of State uh, last week in, in conjunction with the American Association of Geographers. And by my calculation, it was the largest mapathon ever where pizza, neither pizza nor beer was provided. Uh, and it also was, by my, my calculation, the largest number of geographers that were ever in the State Department at any one time. But a mapathon is all about, about using the crowd to densify the digital map of the world. So OpenStreetMap allows us to, to take imagery and trace it onto maps and then have it appear as vectors in OpenStreetMap, where it's available to anyone who wants to, to log on to it. And that's one of the things that the State Department has been fostering. This technology exploded after the Haiti earthquake 10 years ago, when a lot of information was being provided based on satellite imagery being made freely available, and the crowd being able to digitize that imagery for responders to use. Well, one of the problems with the crowd is the crowd doesn't like to be managed by definition. And there was no way to task the crowd to prioritize the information that was needed for the first time responders to make sure that the map could be filled in into all of the gaps that are needed, whether it's, whether it's water or construction or transportation or, or bridges. So that, we worked together with the humanitarian open street map team from the Department of State we developed a project we call MapGive, which is focused specifically on humanitarian emergencies, where we put tasks out to the crowd, and we try to get information prioritized as to what is needed to respond to a crisis. And this, is, this technology doesn't exist without tons of partners. So we partner with GW University, Marie's institution, with the American Red Cross, with the World Bank, with universities all around the world, with embassies all around the world, with youth mappers, with missing map organizations. We're really building a huge group of volunteer mappers. Now there's a controversy in the field over what information is most important. Volunteer geographic information, there's sort of a neo-Marxist school that says if it's not freely volunteered, it doesn't have validity, and if it's tasked by someone, then the man is requesting information, and that's not really what volunteer information is about. And from my position, all, I'm, all I care about is, is good data. 
whether it's big data, whether it's scraped from the web, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's object-based analogy, I think the most important thing is good data, verifiable data. And so the corollary to having a, a, a project and a mapathon that allows you to trace um, vectors onto digital maps from imagery is to get the human geography content from the field. And that's where an organization like the State Department comes in because we have the ability, a lot more than defense and intelligence organizations do, to go out and partner, and partner with universities, and partner with, with local governments, to try to get that local human geography content that will enrich what we understand about a place, and in many ways overcome the failures, I think, of Afghanistan and Iraq and other places where we didn't let local communities map themselves, and we relied on remote mappers or, or other persons who were not as well versed in the local um, communities. So getting back to the issue of urban mapping, my office also has a project called Secondary Cities, which we manage out of my humanitarian information unit, thanks to funding from, from NGA, where we now have 16 cities around the world that are built up, that have built up a cadre of, of well-trained mappers. And the key thing, I don't want to go into the details of the project, but the, the part that I want to raise the most is, I think, in conjunction with, the, with how this conference here is organized, because every one of our projects is based on a triad, a partnership of local government, universities, and NGOs. And if we don't have that triad, we don't do a project. That way you get the local leadership involvement, you build, you build a community of university students who, when provided with freely available commercial satellite imagery, sometimes have a dissertation they can work on for years and sustain the project. And we have NGOs, which also have various tasks that are related to themes that each project has. So uh, in conclusion, I just want to say that anything we do in the open mapping world is, is enriched by partnerships at the local level and is absolutely essential to take advantage of the knowledge that's possessed there because it's really hard to understand these places remotely without tapping into local knowledge. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Um, I just wanted to echo the, my, my uh, department and the American Geographical Society has worked closely with youth mappers. Um, if there's not a chapter of youth mappers at St. Louis University or Wash U, you should definitely get one. It's an organization that was funded with support from USAID. Um, there are youth mapper chapters at universities in uh, 50 countries right now. And one of the interesting things is one of the youth mappers, we had a conference of youth mappers at our university this past summer. And a young team came from Nigeria. They lived in a small city outside of Abuja. And using OSM, they, they mapped not only all the streets in some of these peripheral areas, but they decided, as college students, they thought the worst problem was garbage. So they mapped where all the garbage was being dumped uh, in areas and showed that. And then they shared this map with city officials say, what can we do about the garbage here? And they locals responded and said, okay, we're gonna you know, make this a formal dump, we'll clear it out of there. And then these students got so much attention, they've been going to other uh, cities and towns in Nigeria mapping garbage. Who would have thought mapping garbage? But if you live next to a pile of garbage in your city, it is a problem. And it's something that people feel very strongly about. So that's one example of the power of open source and getting local people mapping their problems. Um, so now we'd like to turn to um, Stephen, and um, as we become more and more urbanized and we're um, trying to um, improve the quality of cities, um, if we improve the quality of cities and make them more sustainable, of course, that's better for human development and well-being. So from your perspective at the Climate Corporation, uh, what are the long-term issues facing uh, questions of urban sustainability, and how can geospatial tools be used to make cities uh, more sustainable uh, for the people who live in them? Okay. Um, Little start, question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll start out now. I'll, I'll focus in on the word that you use the most, sustainable. Uh, it's a word that I don't really care for. 
simply because it is so hard to define. It's very ambiguous, it's, it's polymorphic. You know, I sat on a great panel last week at AAG with, uh, are you out there, Camila? Wave your hand from a US Geospatial Intelligence Foundation where we were discussing GeoInt and under this same idea uh, as, a, as a discipline, how polymorphic and difficult it is to define. Uh, but the reality is yes, 50% of people in cities. By 2050, we're gonna have three billion more people on, you know, give or take, on the planet. We're gonna be farming on one third less land uh, because more people are going to be in the cities, less people are farming. You see where I'm going here, this isn't sustainable. These arrows are moving in the wrong direction from one another. So, so how do we solve that? How do we, how do we break that down? And from our perspective at Climate, we, we are focused heavily on agricultural production, and, and that's our mission, is to, is to uh, help farmers around the world sustainably produce food. Uh, how does this tie to urban settings? Well, it's, you know, we can't separate the two from one another. So from our perspective, food supply, food security, uh, to also include fresh water, as we become uh, more urbanized across the globe, is going to be the most critical factor. Uh, geospatial technology, geospatial data, something that was mentioned by every single person up here was data, data, data. I would argue that the tech isn't growing as fast as the data is growing. And the data is far outpacing our ability to keep up with it from a technology standpoint. When we think about cities, these are hives of information. They're constantly generating, producing data. And that geospatial data is really a new currency. And it's something that we need to grasp hold of and, and understand because it is the connective tissue within a city uh, that ties people groups together, that ties the agricultural and rural communities to those urban communities. So having a strong understanding of that geospatial fabric, uh, whether you're harvesting that data through VGI, whether it's a sponsored data collection program, is gonna be critical. And having your city mapped is absolutely critical. If you believe that your city is mapped well, go through something like Hurricane Katrina and you will quickly figure out how poorly your city is mapped. Uh, I had this experience in New Orleans in 2005 when I was uh, uh, starting my PhD research, and uh, we thought we had a good grasp on the city. I can assure you that we did not, and we did not have a sustainable understanding of, of what was where, who was where, and how to handle it in a disaster setting. So, uh, you know, our my position, if I, if I have to wrap up, is really take hold of that geospatial data fabric of, of your environment, of that urban area, understand its connectivity to the rural environments around it, which supply it and keep it going, and, and take it seriously. Uh, we, we, I think oftentimes we just expect that it's gonna be there, and the reality is that it's, it's absolutely not. So uh, I wanna, stress that we need to quit selling the idea of maps and start selling the idea of, of outcomes with geospatial data. And so leveraging it beyond the map to, to tell the rest of the story. Thanks, Stephen. That's an important point. Um, fortunately, people have been weighing in with their questions, but as the uh, chair, I have one I would like to ask the group, and then I'll turn to some of the ones that have been submitted online. And um, this is actually a, a concern I think that I share with many people. As we enter this world where there's so much uh, open, big data, it's pervasive, uh, voluminous, and much of it is geolocated, um, where are your concerns regarding the sort of ethics and, and privacy of a so such intensely geolocated data that's accessible to many people. Anyone want to take that on? So I think w one of the challenges that we're discussing right now in the United States is about confidentiality. So we have these rich data sources uh, which we're able to analyze these spatial patterns, but at what level of detail can we analyze these patterns while protecting the confidentiality of the people who have agreed to do the survey? 
And so we're trying to, trying to get a sense that we, we want very detailed maps, but we also want to protect the confidentiality of the people who have agreed to give us information about income, about their education. And so we're trying to get a sense of how do we balance this tension between detail, precision, spatially, but at the same time protect the confidentiality of individuals. And with machine learning algorithms, um, we're now, I think the discussion is can we identify individuals um, with these mathematical al algorithms? And so there's, there's an important debate that's happening today in terms of at what level can we release information that's helpful for us to look at spatial patterns, but at the same time protect the confidentiality of people who are agreeing to give us this data? Yes, Liz. Um, I want to build off of something that Steven said um, about saying it's not about the map. And I think one of the, the questions, or it's not always about the map, we'll caveat that. I think one of the questions about, or that, that comes from the privacy conversation, the ethics, is, is before we get to the data question, I think we, because we're going to talk about that all the time, um, we need to think about what story we want to tell with this data. And with um, all of that, what does that mean for our society? What does that mean for our cultures? What stories are we telling? Why are we telling those stories? And I think that question is something that's actually a little harder to answer because we can talk about protection of data. There's a lot of folks who are, who are looking at that, who are coming up with technologies to help um, resolve some of those issues. But what's the step after that data protection? What do you do with that information? What's that story you're going to tell? And, and that is something where I think um, there is a cultural component of, of building up trust, of building up um, confidence that as a society we all need to be stewards of that, be stewards of understanding what story are we trying to tell and what story might not be somebody else's story and instead be a, a different representation. Do we allow for that story as well to emerge in, in the conversation, in the global conversation? I want to uh, point out for the, for the audience here that uh, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, has had a two-year study on ethical guidelines for the use of volunteer geographic information and remote sensing in crisis situations, and they've put out uh, a fairly detailed uh, script according to Do No Harm. So there are guidelines out there to be used, uh, and whenever we do surveys uh, and, and uh, field work, the first training session is always devoted to ethics. That being said, I also think that there are ethics involved in providing good data, getting back to my point about data, because there's nothing wrong than having the democratization of data and putting bad data out there. Uh, and then the final point I wanted to make was, was don't expect the lawyers to catch up to the technology that's going on. Uh, so there, there are going to be guidelines that need to be, that need to be created by those who are doing the work well before you know, the legal um, community catches up to this and codifies it in any way. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I would second that. And look, we're, we're a field like any other academic field. We have human subject protocols that we have to follow doing any sort of research. Any social scientist has to when, when engaging uh, uh, human subjects in, in research protocols. And I think that we as in this room and, and up here, all of us have a responsibility to help uh, define what those protocols need to be for, for spatial data as it pro proliferates and as it becomes more and more commonplace. Uh, we act absolutely have to ask these questions. Uh, at the same time, I think it's a race that we're always going to be in. We are not going to be able to keep up with it. So, uh, you know, do no harm and, and have good intention with what you're doing but uh, we will always be chasing this. Thank you, Stephen. Now I'm going to turn to some of the questions that you submitted, and the, the top of the list is this one. With the ascendancy of big cities, uh, what do you think is the future of rural and small town America? Do those assumptions hold for other parts of the world, such as China, Russia, Kenya, Brazil, et cetera? Anyone want to dive in on this one? Um, sure. Yeah, I, you know, certainly not going to go away or, you know, at least if we, if we believe Walter Christaller and his, his notion of a, of a central place theory, you know, none of this is going to go away. We, we have to have 
the village, to support the town, to support the, the city. And so there's this notion that it's going to completely go away is, is, I think, incorrect. Will it absolutely change? Yes. Uh, is it going to change differently in different environments? Yes. And at different rates? Yes. We take a country like China, where 40% of the people work in agriculture. Uh, if we were to mechanize agriculture in China the same way we have in the U.S., with the speed that we've done it, you would immediately have 40% of a population with very little skill set and very little job opportunity. So is it going to be an overnight change? No. Uh, but is it going to change the dynamics of those communities and the way that they interact with, uh, with their urban counterparts? Uh, I think absolutely. But you could say the same, too, for the mechanization of agriculture, you could say, and, and not just urbanization. Anyone else want to respond to says small towns? All right, I'll go to the next one, which has uh, risen to the top. Um, on the note of emergency planning, uh, how prepared are we with concerns with human geography, mapping critical infrastructure, and lines of communication for an, a major event such as the looming New Madrid earthquake? Um, as an Illinois native, uh, I totally remember the New Madrid, and I also like to remind folks that the city of Chicago is not yet ready to handle earthquakes should the fault line go off. Um, so uh, talking a little bit about crisis mapping and about this community and partnerships, and there's a lot of lessons that we as mappers and people in the world of spatial data learned after Katrina, learned after Haiti, and I think to, to simply answer the question of are, are we ready, well, the answer is no. Um, we don't have that data. I mean, that, that's exactly what, what Stephen's Highland, when you think you have it, you, you don't have it. Um, and when you think you have every piece of information that might possibly be helpful, you, it's, not, it's not there. Could we? Well, this is where your community organizations and partnering organizations, um, having the mapping parties and having um, youth mapper organizations, like getting that information out and available um, in your own community, only you know what is the most important piece of information. So my question is, have you shared that? Does somebody else know that? Can somebody else find that piece of information? One of the things that uh, Lee and I co-chair is we co-chair the Worldwide Human Geography Data Working Group. Um, and through that tool, one of the things that we can do is we put data calls out when there are crises. Um, so for instance, we most recently put a data call out because of the cyclone that hit in Mozambique. And that was an instance going globally where we knew that there was not the level of information that was needed um, to respond immediately and effectively. So we asked the community, and that is something that people um, think about how you can build your community, reach out and tell that data story. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it goes beyond that, and we need to shift our thinking as well to, to using maps and using data to actually prepare and not respond. Right now, they're, they're marginalized to a response mechanism, and we as a society are, are built to prepare for the last disaster as opposed to preparing for the next. And so using new predictive tools like AI with this data to, to shift our thinking to one of preparedness is, is critical, particularly in, in urban areas where your nexus of the human and built environment is so intense. Good point. Um, so another question that has emerged from the, our audience is, what challenges and successes have you had finding ways to store and curate data in an age of infinite data production? So the curating and storing, anyone want to take that on? I think there are lots of organizations that are curating and storing data. Uh, the challenge is that those organizations are not integrated, that they're usually um, task or project specific. Um, you know, PICS is, an org is, a, is something that uh, NGA is using in other parts of the government. Uh, our secondary cities projects uses a geo node, which is an open data platform. I'm trying to work on wildlife trafficking for them to use a a similar um, geographic information system dictionary so that various different projects that are in different countries can, can track the crimes. Uh, UN has a number of platforms. 
So I think the real challenge is how we can cut through all of the various different projects that have different patrons and different donors and different funding debt mechanisms and different priorities and different projects to integrate, to integrate those data. So it's less of a problem of, of um, data storage and curation. It's more of a problem of, as to how we make those data available at the right scale to the right communities at the right time, which is, is, is very, very difficult. I think one of the challenges is uh, duplication of effort. So there's lots of data that's out there, but different people want to house it. And so I think we need to work together uh, to think about how we think about these holistically. And not everybody needs to house the exact same data. And so I think that would help us think about uh, innovation if we think regionally or if we think holistically about where we want to store this data. And it's going to go back to open source, that um, we don't have to have private control over it. We just have to make it available open and have a community of users uh, maintain it. Liz, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, just one thing to add on to. I couldn't agree more with the integration component. Um, I have to put my government hat on for a moment because another thing that is super important for us is standardization. So um, before we get to some of the, at the underpinning of curation is standardization. So for us in the world of human geography, Welcome to um, job security and absolutely a place that we're growing. So um, there are so many places in the world of human geography where we have to start standardizing some of that content so we can do it over and over again and repeat that. So um, that's, a, that's a space that is growing. Um, a lot of folks are working in that to help us and that's really one of those both challenges and successes, because we've had some initial successes, and we cer certainly have some more challenges, because we don't all agree, um, and that's another component about this. Um, a long time ago, I used to say, how many definitions of cultural geography are out there? Just cultural geography. Last time I counted, there was 42. Um, they're all valid, but, but which one needs to be the standard? Should they all be the standard? So it's really challenging us to think a little bit differently about how we do standards. And actually, there's several questions about standardization and how you handle this data. Can you give a specific example of how a, a new kind of data has come available to you and you've worked to try and get a standardization of that data? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we collect, over the last couple of years, we've collected about 70 trillion points with a T. That's a lot of data. Uh, coming off of agricultural equipment. Believe it or not, these companies don't have a data standard. <laughs> and uh, we're talking about multiple dimensions, multiple resolutions, space, time, uh, and, and there isn't a great storage system out there. So we've had to sort of create that ourselves. What I would say is that the, the standard should fit the use case. And not all standards are well suited for, for every use case. But there's a core baseline of metadata, and for us it's less about, and we, we consume tons of public data, private data, uh, data off of machines, petabytes of information, and for us it's, it's less about what's there as long as it's documented. We can write the ETL to, to tell the story and, and connect the dots. That, that's fairly easy, as long as it's documented. So for me, I, I quit arguing about standards, absolute standards, a long time ago, and focused more on just document the data with something. Getting back to our Secondary Cities project, that's a good example, I think, where we have standards for all of our projects, and uh, in particular, metadata, which I think uh, this group will appreciate, and the fact that we make that data available to, to all the cities and, and all their citizens in an open platform even uh, parts of the city that aren't counted in the censuses uh, has led to uh, some cooperation by the, by the urban planners as well. So that's the power of open data with good standards. Um, and to put another plug in for secondary cities, one of the things that I love um, when you visit their website is there's actually training on how to do metadata documentation and have that accessible. That's, I love having that out there in the community. For us at NGA, one of the things that we have started to focus on is um, mapping where people live. So uh, back to my myth busting, um, do you think that we have mapped all of the places in the world? I really hope that your answer to that question is, is no, because I can't tell you 
the name of a town or a neighborhood or um, a community. And I, I can maybe tell you some of the official ones, which is our GeoNames work, and that has, um, has a global coverage, and we've got a lot of that done. But can I tell you the unofficial official ones? So can I tell you where Ukrainian village is on a map? Um, and have it at a standard and, and where it was in the past and where it is today. Ukrainian village in Chicago, Chicago girl right here, go Cubs. Um, sorry, Cardinals fans, I totally had to get that out there. Um, but that is what we have created at NGA is what we call our populated places framework, our populated places methodology, which is about creating the same process and coming up with a new standard and repeating that process of, of how we place people and their in their place names and where it is geographically. Thanks. And I'm, I'll take one more question here from um, the app. Um, is accessibility to new and emerging technologies for historically marginalized and disenfranchised citizens compatible with present day capitalism? Oh, it just jumped on me. And increasingly uh, hierarchy, hi hierarchical social structures here in the US. And are some elites concerned about the masses actually having full access to all the available data? I can just speak personally. I think p part of um, my goal here uh, as a professor at St. Louis University is to make the data available to empower everyday citizens to use that data to address uh, historical patterns of discrimination, to show that there, there, were, there was a rated influence of these practices and policies that put communities and neighborhoods at a disadvantage in today's um, marketplace. And so we want to use this data to look at policies to think about spatial justice, to think about reinvesting in communities. And so I, I think, um, if anything, we, this data has the, the role to empower everyday citizens to take control of the data and to revisualize and, and to vision a future for their neighborhoods and to understand the policies uh, the work that's required to get to that to that dream of what they would see in their neighborhoods. I promised Marie I would get a plug-in for the conference that the American Geographical Society is running on November 21 and 22 in New York City. Uh, it's called Borders in a Borderless World. I feel it's appropriate for me to make that plug since my only real official responsibility as a State Department geography, geography is over boundaries. And increasingly, we are getting our digital boundaries corrected by crowdsourcing out, by making the information available. Lloyd Weber here from NGA is a great uh, partner with us on that. And it's every boundary in the world with digital precision needs correction. And we are getting people from remote areas telling us that US government's official boundaries are wrong, and we're correcting them. So that's a great value of making this information available. Great. Thank you very much. And that's right on time. You're a wonderful panel, and you're a great audience. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take a short break and resume at 10.45. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the host of Government Matters, Mr. Francis Rose. Thank you very much. And uh, what, what's really gratifying about an event like this is when there are a lot of people here who know each other and have interests in common and so on. It's nice to see that you're here in this room and not out networking and chatting and having a good time and going to Panera and whatever. Um, it's great that you're here and that you're involved and engaged in what's going on. It's my pleasure to introduce to the stage uh, for this discussion on the evolving capabilities uh, for the GEO and Enterprise Jack Dangermond, who is the president of ESRI, and Mark Munsell, who's the chief technology officer at NGA. Gentlemen, come on up and take a seat. Um, thank you for participating in this conversation. I, um, I'm reminded, too, that, um, by the way, I got the app on my phone this morning. And I went to submit a question to the first panel, and I realized that I was submitting a question to uh, my 80s playlist, which didn't do anybody any good. So, but I've, I've, I'm glad I practiced and I mastered the technology. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for doing this. I want to start with this concept that we covered earlier in our conversation, and that is the significance of St. Louis to what is going on 
in the, as the GeoInt world evolves. Mark, why don't you start, because being an NGA person, I imagine you have some insight into why here, why continue here, and so on. So uh, I, I'd like to point out that I'm actually from St. Louis. Okay. I was born in St. So Louis. So you're a little biased. I, I'm a little biased. <laughs> so, okay. So I have to ask as a sport, somewhat of a sports yeah, guy. Why, why did she say that? Where is she? Where is Liz? Get back in here, Liz. At this point in time. Did you hear the, the moo? At this point in time, who do you root for in football or in pro football, or have you just given up? Yeah, no, I've given up. Okay, um, fair enough. Please go ahead. So, I mean, occasionally I'll watch the Chiefs. But, okay, uh, all right, that's legit. Yeah. All right, okay. anyway, uh, back to GeoInt, sorry. Yeah, St. Louis. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> like the Admiral said this morning, we go way back. We go way back to World War II uh, when we had the um, Aeronautical Information uh, Charting Center here. And so uh, it really is, you know, you can, you can ask your neighbor, you can ask uh, uh, people in your church, uh, somebody in there at least had worked for the mapping agency, mm -hmm. right, the, the term that we use, or knew somebody that worked for the mapping agency. And they always said, well, we're not sure exactly what they did there. Right. Mapped, but that's about <laughs> the extent of it. And so it, it really is in St. Louis's DNA. And, and what's great is to see it evolve like it has. And what's really special is to see what's happening right now and what's about to happen when we build this new facility. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much energy behind it. I probably attend at least two or three times a month events, not to this scale, but events that um, where we bring the community together and we talk about this geospatial technology ecosystem. Um, and there's so much energy behind it, so much energy, uh, the city, uh, the businesses here, um, it's, it's a special thing that's happening right now. And for the, in this moment in time, NGA is acting as a catalyst for that, but, but we're also acting as a, uh, uh, a, 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 a way for the community to get behind this entire industry. Industries like, like Jack's industry, like uh, ESRI. Mm -hmm. Jack? Well, there's something about St. Louis, wouldn't you guys agree? I mean, there's, there's something special. And part of it is the academic framework. There's three major universities, strong geography and geographic thinking. There's, of course, NGA. There's something about St. Louis because it has the St. Louis Botanical Gardens. This is, okay, that, that's not a joke. <laughs> that's, that's for real. Uh, Don't yeah. feel bad. I've never heard botanical gardens ever get a whole lot out of, out of audiences. It's not. You don't know Jack's on. background, it's, do you? Not, well, it's but it's historically it has not been a big applause line. Shameful as that is, it just doesn't seem to. Have it's worked. shameful, really. It is. Uh, it's the uh, it's the repository of world knowledge on plants. I mean, it's one of the great herbariums run by Peter Raven, and so that's part of the thing, the things that it's one of the things that I think creates a sense of community here. People participate in the gardens. There's a cultural aspect of the gardens, uh, outreach. How many of you have gone to the St. Louis Botanical Gardens? Take, take wow, a look that. at that. I mean, right? I mean, it's a beautiful place. Where it's have you thing. been all your life? I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> not at the Botanical Gardens. You're apparently. not connected. Those are all biophiliacs. You know, they are connected. Wow. You know, they're connected with nature. Wait a minute. Where's ja dictionary.com? Jack, Jack runs a GIS company as a hobby. I see that. <laughs> his, his real job is? Biophilia. Botanist. Yeah. Botany. I had no idea. So actually, there is a sense of community here that's unlike most large cities in America or the world. And I don't exactly know how to explain it. Does, ev does everybody feel it here in the room? Yeah, I, th I think that's it. And it has to do with local participation and leadership and involvement. And I think the, the fact that NGA is here is really a remarkable thing. So I don't know exactly what your question is. It's what, what, what I get what a lot makes, of that. What, what, <laughs> I don't know why. What makes St. Louis special is a sense of community, sense of pride, sense of creating the future as a community. And what a great place to house the world's largest geospatial organization on the planet, which creates these maps and charts that from my perspective 
are creating the future of the planet. So Mark, you said something that I want to follow up on, and you talked about the future of the campus here in particular. What's over the horizon in this space, not just because of the campus and not just at NGA, but in the, in the geo landscape in general? What does the next five to 10 years look like? And what are the technologies that you think your colleagues, you and your colleagues will be relying on? And what are the things that maybe we have a broad framework of understanding about, but don't know the specifics of execution yet, that kind of thing? Yeah, so um, this technology is really, it's sort of embedded everywhere, um, both the technology and the tradecraft, I'll say. But um, it's, it's really uh, ubiquitous. If you think about what you do today with your handheld devices, if you think about what you do today on the internet, um, if you think about uh, all the interaction that you have with products and services, commercial products and services out there, um, they, there's, there's a location uh, aspect to it. And the more and more uh, advertising technology, uh, the more and more any kind of uh, geospatial uh, aware technology um, th that's put into place, this technology grows. Um, uh, we, we derive new, uh, new thought, new, new thinking, uh, new approaches. And so it's really in the, in the last, Jack, what would you say, in the last... 10 years especially, but I'll say that even in the last few years, it's really, you know, you look at all of the Silicon Valley startups, you look at um, uh, a lot of companies out there that are trying to harness data, especially where it's, it's um, you know, uh, data where, where either you're the product or the device is the product, let's say Facebook or Google and what have you. Uh, they, have, they have to have spatial technology to make sense of, of this data. And because of that, it's pushing into uh, you know, compute and storage and cloud. It's pushing into areas of technology um, that, that it never has been before. It's, you know, it used to be on the desktop, Jack. The yeah. GIS software used to be running on your computer. And more and more, we're harnessing big, da big data, big compute, um, and harnessing this global infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, to be able to do things with this kind of data that nobody else has ever dreamed of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, NGA, like most organizations in the world, has a long history of, of separate stovepiped kinds of activities that are building, in their case, geospatial intelligence. And mapping was a part of it that's really centered out of, out of St. Louis here, and imagery is a part. And across, broader speaking, across the intel community, there's many stovepipes of human intelligence, signal intelligence. These are all kind of disciplines in their own setting. Uh, two big things have happened. One is the internet or inter distributed computing connected with networks. And the second one is, is geography. And there are two integration components. So as we look at the future architectures, the architecture that, that Mark is frankly emerging and pushing, it is connecting all the different parts of NGA, the image intelligence, the map intelligence, or the human intelligence, they're bringing it all together using network computing. And going back to the previous communications and previous seminar, they talked a lot about distributed, and the world of open science is now distributed open science. It's all getting interconnected through networks, but it's also becoming interconnected and fused through location, or I would say geography, the science of our planet. This foundation, science integrates all of the ologies, geology, sociology, psychology, uh, biology, even botany. <laughs> we, can, we can bring Back it all. Back to that. We, yeah, well, it's all about that. It's about the living system. But it, it is the framework on which all the ologies can be brought together. And it's also the framework in which all the different intelligence types can be brought together. And it can be communicated through maps maps that allow us to see things that you can't normally see. Patterns, relationships, um, it's exposing the world. So, I've been ranting on and on here, but the last few years at NGA are tying all the different pieces of national intelligence together and using geography, the science of our world, to expose that, to interconnect it, and uh, Mark's work here of bringing AI into that, 
AI isn't actually the leader. AI is one of the mechanisms that allow us to analyze that mm -hmm. and bringing in big data into it. Um, it's not the big data that's interesting. It's the big understanding that's interesting. Um, and bring in visualization into that so that it can reach the warfighter and reach analysts and reach, reach the, um, the benevolent mm -hmm. heart of, of, of uh, what America is all about. All, all of those things are being brought together and will continue to be brought together. And the center of that, let me just go back to St. Louis, why it's so important, is the great work that are done by the, the people, the men and women here working in, inside of NGA. So when I was on campus at NGA, as I mentioned earlier, and I had a chance to talk to Director Cardillo and then some of the others, he kept bringing me around to a point that I think is useful for this conversation, and that is the, the mission of NGA started with maps, but it's not maps. It's to provide information to warfighters and, and others in government who need to make decisions. And I wonder how so the technology that we're talking about supports that, and as you just said eloquently, that's not the point. The point is not AI, the point is not machine learning, the point is not anything except how do we use what are our tools of the realm, which is mapping, to provide that information. Am I thinking about it right? And if so, then what are the technologies that you expect to make the biggest dent in providing that information in the coming years? So as the CTO of the agency, I'd say you're wrong. It's all about the artificial intelligence and playing with computers. <laughs> no. No, as our, as our Admiral said this morning, as our Director said this morning, um, this, look, everything we do here, the reason that we're here today, the reason that we're building a new, new facility in St. Louis, the reason that, we're, that we exist, right, is to give advantage to our country, right, and give advantage to the warfighter. Uh, um, and as Director Cardell used to say, to never, to never allow a fair fight. Mm -hmm. You might have heard him say that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so a a everything that we do is, is wrapped into that context. So some of the stuff, of course, that would enable us to do that in the future when we're talking about technology, um, you know, we do throw out our, the artificial intelligence sort of uh, catchphrase, buzz phrase, you know, uh, maybe a little too much. Um, we're, really, we're really working with applying that technology now. And it can go along a lot of different paths. But I'd say the sort of um, right now, the, the, the thing that probably intrigues NGA the most in terms of technology is this idea of computer vision, right? And that's because we have thousands and thousands of analysts that, that work every day that, that provide the vision, right? And, and what's happening in their head is over time, they learn and understand what they're looking at. They put it in context. They are able to um, uh, be able to see what's happening, predict what will happen, happen and provide, provide that advantage to our to our policymakers and our, and our warfighters. So if we can have the machine do more of that, that means the analyst can do more of this. I'm pointing at my head. <laughs> the analyst can do more of this, but the analyst can write, put, put it in context, can see the bigger geopolitical um, picture, can be able to sift through and find, you know, find the information and the noise, um, and be able to put it all together and provide that, that information to, to the uh, uh, decision makers. That piece, uh, we're, we're close. We've had some breakthroughs. Uh, we've, we've gotten to the point where we can teach computers to do things that, that maybe were rote or maybe that were difficult to do repetitive. Um, but we're still, we're still far off in terms of being able to, to make that, a, that technology that we can use it at the 100% level. Mm -hmm. That's something that we'll, st we'll still be striving for for years to come. Yeah, I think what, what Mark is talking about is a process and framework that consists of six different parts. Think of them like a flow diagram around an information system. It starts with measurement. And NGA's history has been all about measurement, measuring with synoptic uh, satellite pictures and also measuring on the ground maps. And then the second step is visualizing that through maps and uh, now 3D rotating in real time maps. That's sort of building on measurement. And the third is analytics. And this has been about overlaying maps and other phenomena uh, to be able to predict, to be able to suggest where to target or where, to, where bad guys are going to go. Or, and this is true, by the way, of all geographic information systems. It's analytics. And then the next step is 
being able to design strategies on top of that analytics, like should we go here or there, um, where are the bad guys moving, it's broadly called prediction, mm -hmm. and then it moves into decision support. Should we do this alternative or that alternative? Well, we want to have full understanding of the situation, and that starts with measurement analytics and so on and builds on it. So now we see decision support. And then, finally, it's action, actionizing, because uh, the warfighter takes that knowledge and actionizes it, takes it to action. So that little flow diagram, I hope you guys are putting in your head, is what I sometimes call a science of where. It's the, the generation of science that brings all those separate divisions of NGA or separate parts of organizations together. And more broadly, that science is pervasive across virtually all of human activities. It's true in commercial. It's true in government, uh, where we're measuring, you know, in policing. It's measuring bad guys and predicting where they're going to be and making an action. And it's true in forestry, and it's true in, in predicting the floods out here in the, in the river. Um, all those things are being wrapped together. So while we are very focused here in this conference around improving our nation's national security agenda, the reality of this location or geolocation, or I think of it as geography, that process and framework, uh, is evolving to become what I would call a new kind of infrastructure, a geospatial infrastructure. And like the web itself, it's including measurements and analytics, and you can just see the web with all of these parts attached to it, and visioning and visualization and ultimately human action. And in that sense, um, my own personal feeling, I've been doing this a long time, I think that this is the time right about now where this science shows up and becomes actually an instrument of evolution. And that's a lot to say, that it actually kicks in all of our different social institutions you know, measuring, analyzing, visualizing, deciding, designing, planning, acting, we all start to be affected by this instrument uh, called the geospatial infrastructure. And again, going back to NGA, it's leading the way in our federal government, not only for, not only for intel, not only for military, and here I want to speak to everybody in this room, but also the spin-offs that it's doing in uh, what the what uh, was mentioned earlier this morning, benevolent action, you know, the thing that our country really has been so amazing in doing, you know, providing Landsat to the world, impact of that. This is, this is now providing geospatial intelligence that I think will impact the planet. It'll, it'll, it'll play into the way it works out. It'll turn around some of the arrows that are going in the wrong direction. It'll, and I, I think it's multi-participant, it's multi-science, it's open. It's a platform that this country intends to, to provide as a, as a kind of gift for helping the planet evolve. And, and this, is, this is for you young people. Man, this is the field to get into because it's, it's going to be full-time, full-bore, bringing all of our best technologies, our best science, our best design thinking, our best decision support to be able to address these greater challenges that are facing all of us. So speaking of young people and coming into this uh, career field, two of the questions that we've gotten already focus on that uh, idea. One of them is about the most important skill sets that the, the new generation of talent will need given the technology trajectory that we're on. And the other is simply how to get people who may not be thinking about, or may not even be aware about of this as a career field, mm -hmm. to consider it as a career field. Mark, do you want to start? Sure. Um, <clears throat> kind of along the same themes Jack just mentioned there, that it's, you know, it's this ubiquitous technology, that it's, it's really ingrained in everything. Every, everything can be located in space and time. And um, so really, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, computer science today. You, when you go to universities, you'll see them pairing computer science classes with a lot of traditional uh, liberal arts types of courses. And I think for, for NGA in particular, that pairing of people that uh, have a good understanding, a good 
good uh, of, of some of the soft sciences like political science or, um, or history or government. Um, t taking that context of the ge geopolitics and, and where the world's at today um, and, and the United States' place in that world in terms of national security, taking that and applying it to uh, data science, data analytics, uh, software engineering, um, and what you can do to take this data and, and uh, perform queries and correlations and, and geostatistical analysis. I think that combination of, of uh, skills is really, is really where you know, NGA is, is finding our sweet spot for, for folks that have both of those things. Um, I, and I think, of course, that those combination of skills would apply broadly to a lot of other industries. Um, it's that pairing that's, that, that's important to us. And what we find is a lot of folks that, that major in uh, geography, GIS emphasis in university, they do, ha they do get those skills. They, you know, they are taking a Python course. They are writing uh, ArcPy or using Jupyter Notebooks and, and writing Python um, and other languages to build applications uh, either inside of Esri or in the OpenGL stack or, or you know, a variety of different platforms that are out there. And so uh, we're, we're really looking for more and more of that kind of talent uh, promote that for, um, for anyone that's in class right now, whether they're sort of on the, that soft science side or their, their photogrammetry and geomatics, Richard, wherever you are, uh, and geodesy and, and, and those, those harder sciences. Um, we, we need that mesh of both, and, and I think that uh, NGA would be an ideal <laughs> workplace for those of you that are looking at that. Now that, that, that's sure. a little bit of a plug, isn't it? I mean, really, yeah, yeah, it is. By the way, I am hiring software engineers. Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> by the way, so am I. So, I mean, it's just, it's too oh. much, really. All right, so let's not fight. Uh, well, let's you know, not fight. We collaborate, man. <laughs> we really do, except in that one area. But, but that's a legitimate point. I mean, yeah. m the problem, Mark, that you're up against is Jack's operation is a little bit more live than the federal government's hiring process. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> now let's not gloat, Jack. Yeah, really, no. I don't, really. It's, it's, is, not it cooler, sure. is it cooler to work at Esri than NGA? Probably not. Oh. Okay, so. I just threw you a Did bone, you get that? man. Did I threw you a bone, that's all. <laughs> all right, so you've got, you've got the mission on your side. We do. And that, how do you use that point. then? Oh, that's a great point. Um, in your in, in your recruiting process and in your retention process, because once you've got them, the, cha the biggest challenge is to keep them. It is a great, thank you. Thank, you, are, you are setting me up, this is awesome. I've done um, this before. <laughs> it's not fair, he's speaking twice. I've always spoke, you know. <laughs> Don't you have some plants to think about or something? Yeah, yeah just a moment. <laughs> just look, a moment. Yeah. Look, you're right, Francis, we, we have the mission. And we said it earlier, and, and our director said it earlier, that, you know, that's what we have, and, and um, uh, you know, here's an example. It's, uh, what is it, 11, 10, or whatever. My son is fast asleep. My son works in what we call the counterterrorism airborne cell at, at NGA, um, and he'll, he'll be devastated that I'm, I'm talking about him. Uh, but he works uh, from 6.30 to 6.30, right? And, and when he first went on nights, he was, he was really worried. He talked to me about it. He goes, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do this. You know, I have to switch my schedule, and I have to stay up all night. And now, nah, obviously, he's drinking these energy drinks. That's awful. But um, every time he comes, he comes home from these 12-hour these shifts, I ask him how, how it goes, right? And most of the time, he's smiling ear to ear. Uh, and the reason is because of the mission. Right, because of what he's supporting, who he's supporting, and how he's supporting them, it means, it means something to him. Yes. It means something to our family, and it means something, something to our country. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the juice for a lot of young people today. They know they're doing something greater than themselves. And so when, when we recruit software engineers, when we recruit data scientists, it's a fine balance. I mean, we're in this, in St. Louis, we're in this World War II. Um, sort of gray federal space, um, and it can, it can seem kind of like a bummer. Uh, and so when you work at Esri, I mean, it's beautiful. The camp, Jack designed the campus because he's a landscape architect, and he made it beautiful. And so we have this, this dilemma that we're in right now, and I'll just point out that's why it's so important for us. One, one of the tenants, right, one of the reasons that we're building this new campus is to attract talent. 
is to track young people that, that will come in and see this wonderful building. We, we saw a preview of it yesterday. We saw a, uh, a reveal of what the concept building is. And as soon as they started playing, as soon as Ed started playing that guitar riff from Streets With No Name, I, like, I just stood up and I, <laughs> and I pointed at the screen and I said, that's where I want to work. Yeah. And so um, uh, it, it's important to us to, to build this new building and to do it the right way so that we can attract this talent uh, moving into the future. So the other piece of the talent um, question that I think the person that wrote this wrote eloquently, and I'm just going to read it, Jack, and ask you to think about this. Uh, how do we entice our nation's best and brightest to work in the geospatial field in light of near-peer competitors who can direct or conscript their best and brightest to support the state? I mean, in all aspects of government, that's what we're up against. We're up against two peer, near-peer competitors that can tell their people what they're going to be doing to support the national security of those states as opposed to we who have the freedom to do what we choose. And I wonder what you think about what that means about how we go about describing this to people. I mean, other than having Mark go do it for everyone in the United States, what does that look like, do you think? Well, I'm reminded of 50 years ago, almost this month, when I was a student, a young graduate student at Harvard, I found what I wanted to do. Did you find what you wanted to do in life? Not at Harvard, but yes. <laughs> Not a joke. Did you I, find it? Yes. So do you have a passion about it? Yes. Okay, so look, all kidding aside, working in the mission is very motivating. It's probably the most motivating thing, if that's your thing, that you could possibly imagine. Saving people's lives, saving national, you know, putting, putting our country in the best position is very motivating. And finding that personally and then going for it, I found, I was very lucky. I found what I really like to do. And I have not stopped. I still work, you know, 18 hour days all the time. And I'm going to burn out that way because it's like finding something really cool to work on. And uh, yeah, ESRI is a great place to work. NGA is a great place to work. My work is building tools, building powerful software tools that help people do their work better. Those little words are right in the back of my brain. And so we work our ass off to help Mark in his mission because we get motivated about that. So building valuable tools as a software products company is different than doing geospatial in an applied sense inside of NGA. Both of those are great missions. And I'm gonna answer your question in just a second, but I'm kind of building this up because I think first, what makes our country great is that we have the choice to be able to follow our passion, you know, each of us as individuals. And finding that sometimes takes a long time to figure it out. But once you found it, it's like whether you're playing music or whether you're you know, dancing or whether you're a business person or whether you're uh, an intel analyst, man, there's, not, there's no stopping the American spirit. That's my feeling. So I think as young people, we find it, we search around, we try a little of this, we try a little of that. When you find it, it doesn't matter whether it makes a lot of money or no money at all, man, you are robbing yourself if you're not going after your passion. One of my personal friends is, um, um, well, Warren Buffett. He once said, you know, when you find your passion, go for it. Just, and he did it too. I mean, he's just working his way along. And he, he always made this funny joke about, it doesn't work uh, when you don't follow your passion when you want to. It's kind of like, uh, well, I won't even mention Jack, it. can you let me know the next time you have him over for lunch? <laughs> no, well, he said, don't wait. Uh, what did he say? He said some really, it's probably an off-color joke, but don't wait. All until, right. Don't, don't wait until you're old to have sex because it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> it's really kind of a joke, you know. So when you find your passion, go okay. for it. Right? That's a bad joke. I yeah. is, it, is this being recorded? But he said it, not me. Is this thing he on? said it, not me. It was not me. Yeah, I guess I put you up to it. You blame <laughs> anyway. me for that. It's bad, isn't it? <laughs> so you laid out 
some of the qualifications of what would make good talent in this space. What can companies like yours and organizations like yours do that either you're not doing now or you're oh. not doing enough of now you, you're to talking get about in front of those people? Specifics. Yes, to get in front of those people yeah. and say, this is a possibility for you that maybe you don't know exists, but given your abilities and given your interests, this might be where your passion lies. Right. Um, so, so let me say this. We actually get a lot of people knocking on our door. Okay. We get a lot of good people knocking on our door, and we hire some of those good people. Um, where we fall down is uh, providing them the right environment to work in. And, uh, you know, especially with these skills, especially with software engineering, you know, coding, uh, data science, data analytics. Uh, it's hard for us to provide that environment because of all the extra burden overhead that we have with security. Um, you know, they have to get a security clearance. They have to pass their drug test. They have to, you know, have to run through all these wickets. And then we put them, you know, in this environment that's very, very secure. Um, and in many cases, it, it, it's... In many cases, it's soul crushing because they don't have the tools that they need. They don't have the 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 camaraderie and, and the and the mentorship and the leadership that they need to do some of these new new um, uh, trades in the in the NGA. And they just don't have the compute environment that they need. Now I'll say this: you know we recognize this, and it's a it's a problem I have in our agency that I, as a CTO, am trying to fix, and it's my number one priority to fix. And I've, been, I, I've had this as my number one priority for about six weeks now when, it, when I started to see people leave. Good people that we've hired that just would come up to me and say, Mark, I, I don't have the environment. There's some in here that have left. Uh, I, I saw them earlier. Uh, Ryan, I don't know if you're out there. But um, <laughs> he's, he's leaving now. <laughs> <laughs> come back. Come back, Ryan. We're going to fix it. No. So, so that's... And other government agencies have this problem. Yep. We lock, we lock this down, especially in the DOD and the IC. And so I have to open it up, and I have to allow people to do, I have to allow people to try things that you normally couldn't try. I have to allow people to download software that they normally wouldn't be allowed to download. I have to allow people to operate in a space beyond our controlled perimeter. And so that's, that's we're working on that. We're working on both the technology to do that as well as the location to do that. And it strikes me that your challenge there, just quickly because I don't want to impede on Jack's time, it strikes me that the challenge there is not processes or what, it's culture and worldview and it's the way people are thinking about how they've done this line of work for the that's, last that's right. 50 or 100 years. That's right. That's right. And um, I, one of the reasons I was so successful early in my career because it wasn't quite as locked down. I was, I mean, I, I downloaded software. Where's the, we don't, the CISO's not here, our chief information <laughs> security officer. Plus, you know, they, we didn't have chief information security officers back then. Right. Mm -hmm. Downloaded whatever I wanted. I walked in equipment right past the guards. I hooked up stuff. I made systems, right, because I was in control of doing that. Admiral, Admiral notice what he's saying. Be careful to this boy. <laughs> yes, but it was all past tense in his defense. Yeah, right. Past you, tense. You've reformed yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking to reform myself back to that, Jack, and, and helping our, enable our folks back to that level of freedom so that they can try, experiment, and, and work things that, that normally you can't in our environment. That's, that is something important for us to change in our environment. Well, uh, people live in impoverished worlds, um, you know, and I'm not saying NGA is an impoverished world with respect to technology. But uh, I came from that space, and I was able to achieve. I mean, and also looking back 50 years, we worked on mainframe computers. It was, I mean, it was horrible, but yet we were able to do great things. Mm -hmm. And the science and the and the basic concepts of it were exactly the same as it is today. So I don't buy into the idea that it, that you have to buy something in order to do something. Or there's a sort of a have. I say when it was uh, have do be. You ever heard that? You have to have something in order to do something, in order to be something. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, like I have to have the right dancing shoes or the like, you know, little girls do this every year. They have to have a tutu and the right dancing shoes in order to do dancing, in order to be a dancer. But yet, 
once in a while you'll get these little girls that get up on stage and they're just a dancer and they don't have the right stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's have, do, be. It's really the other way around. From my perspective, you be a dancer and then you'll get the stuff and you'll, you'll do the stuff. and you'll, So just turning that whole metaphor around for young people who want to really be something, okay, be it. And you'll, 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 you'll do the things that are necessary. So it starts with being. And I think being at NGA is a, is a privilege. I mean, you know, speaking to your mission, Mark, I mean, it, isn't what, it wasn't what NGA created or what you now create for your staff that allows them to really be great analysts or really see things that others can't. That's what NGA does, right? You enable people to see things that others can't. Uh, what's a magnificent gift that is. Uh, so I, I don't, I'm rambling off in a different direction here, uh, Francis. But no, but that's, it, it's insightful because the talent question seems to me to be the most pervasive question for any area of the government where any kind of on the edge skill is going to be necessary in yeah. the next 10 to 25 years because the inherent, I'll say roadblocks, because I don't work for the government and I can, that exist for him to bring someone on as opposed for you to bring someone on and for him to keep someone on as opposed to you to keep someone on, that strikes me as the most difficult challenge that a government organization has to bring and your insight's valuable there, Mark. Let me bring this back home. One of the reasons that um one of the reasons that we're looking at hiring software engineers in St. Louis is because you can, you can have a living in St. Louis, right? Our government salary that we pay a software engineer, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you can actually have a great life here. It's, it's, it's tougher in D.C. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more difficult to live off Tell the same salary. Tell me about it. Um, and so I'll, I'll go back to how great St. Louis is. That's uh -huh. One of the great things about this place is, yeah, we have culture. Yeah, we have the Cardinals, Liz. I just said culture and cardinals together. That is our culture. Um, Whatever it takes. But you can afford to live here. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so as far as bringing that technical talent, um, uh, Illinois too, Missouri and Illinois, that we'll, we'll just go with the whole Midwest. We have outstanding universities. University of Illinois is here too, by the way, and put a plug in for them. Um, we have some of the best computer science universities in, in, in the United States. And if we can attract five-star talent from those, those universities, you know, it's, it's just like a five-star linebacker. Sometimes they don't want to be uh, uh, six hours away from mom. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they want to be two hours away from mom. So we, we'll recruit them, right, down to St. Louis, and they can have a, have a great career, work on a great mission, while actually making a good, good living. Um, this question is kind of gets to the kind of gets to the challenge for your organization in, in 2019. How will NGA keep pace with the rest of society, or more appropriately, how will it maintain its lead in geospatial technologies when they're now a ubiquitous utility? We've touched on this a little bit, but I think that question, as it's written, gets right to the heart of where we are in the last five minutes of this conversation. Go ahead. Why don't you go first on this one, Jack? I feel bad. I keep asking him first. No, it's quite okay. <laughs> um, um, okay. Uh, yeah, I, you know the refinement, the exquisite, the the special, right? That that will always be our wheelhouse uh -huh. at NGA. Um, so it is ubiquitous. You you know the the technology will be part of our everyday lives. Um, what's different is that we'll have we'll, we have those extra special sources, those extra special ways of getting information. Um, that, that the rest of the world doesn't have. And, and again, another, another proud moment for our agency uh, to be able to use those things. Uh, what did you say, Jack? I, I, I saw the director write it down. It was, we were able to see things that other people can't see. Is oh that God, what you I said? wish you wouldn't say that. <laughs> that's, my new, that's my new thing. <laughs> you wrote it down. It's a great line. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. talk about this outside this room. That's mine. <laughs> that phrase is mine. It, uh, it came out of my mouth. I really apologize. That, I was supposed to do it in July, Admiral. <laughs> You're going to know exactly why I blew it. My people are going to But that's it, me. though. What you said, Jack, is it. We're able to see things that others can't yeah, see. Okay. I said it first. I just okay. want, I want everybody to know. 
I'm fascinated by this idea, though, that you said something and your people are going to kill you. You run the place. <laughs> if they give you a hard time, just fire them. Enable, enable. Right? You can do that. You have no idea. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> probably not. I just blew it. Anyway, uh, what I want to say about that is government is changing because private sector technologies are maturing and they're doing what used to be done only in government. You know, the satellite system is an example of it. Now we see commercialized satellites. Uh, road data, for example, used to be the domain of the Census Bureau. Now we see it in private sector companies. And we see it not just in the geospatial data, but in all sorts of interesting things. So these advances uh, that big companies like Microsoft and Amazon and Google and others are making are really replacing some of the services that government has done in the past. And we see this even more so in the developing world. It's challenging governments. It's ca challenging government policy. And our adversaries to this country, the Chinese, are moving in with, with their, uh, you know, their cloud computing, taking over whole countries and uh, bringing on a pile of stuff that is replacing many of the functions of government. What does this mean for governments of the future? Do we sort of back away? We think of these as, as we got to sort of regress into, no, now is the time when government has to be resilient and take advantage of those private sector things that are emerging. Uh, we don't sort of give up and say, no, that's going to be a private sector thing or it's going to be this or that. No, we, we say our policies must change. Things like policies about privacy that we're all facing now with location. Uh, policies about governing, uh, policies about open, policies about transparency, all these things now is the time where government leaders and uh, bureaucrats both uh, need to stand up and, and pioneer new ways to take advantage of this mammoth change that's occurring because of the technology transformation that's occurring on the planet. What does it mean when geospatial infrastructure will be uh, around us everywhere? This is an interesting question. Uh, so, does NGA sort of say, well, we're being competed against or we're obsolete? No, absolutely not. NGA has to grab these tools and move from, say, measurement into analytics, from big data to big understanding, from uh, being able to support a few to support our entire nation to be able to be more competitive against the rising threats of, of, uh, of our adversaries who are, con you said, conscripting people to do work. We need to have an open democracy response where we bring in all of our people and let them be motivated to play it out. And some will be motivated to build private sector software tools or other services, but many people that will be motivated to go into public service because they see that they're the same people that have always gone to public service. They have, they have not only the skills, but they also have the heart and the passion to make this country great. So watch out, China. Watch out, Russia, because they don't know what they're messing with with respect to, they don't know what they're messing with respect to the American spirit. What I especially respect about that statement is that you end it at exactly zero on the clock. That's just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen as an event moderator. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you very much, Matt. Very welcome. Delightful discussion. I appreciate it. Um, so we have lunch for the general session in the lobby and outside, and we are back here at 1245. I'll see you then. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the host of Government Matters, Mr. Francis Rose. Thank you uh, very much. I will say again what I said a little bit earlier because I love this. I, there's nothing more that is kind of a bummer then you come back after lunch and everybody's kind of straggling and maybe some people have had enough for the day and they go and you get on stage after lunch and the room's half full 
And that's not the case here at all. Look around. There's a very full room uh, to hear a terrific afternoon lineup. And I am very pleased to welcome to the stage uh, a person who I've had the pleasure of talking to on a number of different levels, on and off the air over the last several years, uh, to give you some insight into what really the cutting edge of this space looks like. Uh, Dr. Stacy Dixon is the director of the Intelligence Advanced uh, Research Projects Activity and really sees some of the most amazing things going on both in government and outside of government. And she's here to talk to you about that nexus. Please welcome Dr. Dixon. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, we're gonna do that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. You don't know how important it is to have that kind of energy from the audience. And I'm also looking forward to the questions that I know you guys are going to be thinking about and typing into the app during the course of my talk. So my name is Stacy Dixon. I am the director of the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, or IARPA. For those of you who've never heard of IARPA, it's like DARPA, except much smaller and much poorer. However, we get to do some of the really uh, most interesting things within the intelligence community with respect to solving challenges that can be solved with science and technology. What I want to do for you today is a little bit of telling you who we are, uh, but mostly talking about the kind of work that we're working, the, what we're doing right now, especially open opportunities. We are an organization that does not do research in-house. That means all of my research dollars goes out to industry and academia or teams of industry and academia because the talent that I need to solve those challenges for the intelligence community are all out in the country and sometimes out in the world and not in the building in which I reside. So please keep that in mind and I hope you see something today that makes you inspire to want to work with IARPA. Partnering for innovation, innovation that, that really is the uh, underlying key of what we do. Uh, we work with those who are coming from different kinds of backgrounds, and I mentioned the teaming aspect. Most of the projects we work on are very interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, so those teams are extremely important. And the ones that I've seen that have been the most successful have really been those that are drawing on the best of academia and industry to come together, bringing skill sets that are different from each other and really working to solve the challenges. But for our part, we try to set really innovative, challenging questions out there that then people can seek to solve. And we do that by trying to think about what's going on in the future, what's going on in the present, and then investing in a way that the research agencies that are part of the intelligence community, uh, investing in things that they can't. So we were created about 12 years ago to have not an operational mission, but a mission in which we support those other agencies who happen to have operational missions. What happened is, the time and effort that it takes to come up with research, especially those investments that are five, 10 years in the making, if you're comparing that to what you can do today with someone in the field who maybe is, whose life is on the line, who needs the capability tomorrow or in a couple of hours, and you've got someone like me coming in saying, I've got this great idea for you, but it's not gonna be ready for five years. Who do you think is gonna win in that, that context? it's gonna to go to the person in the field whose life is on the line. And so they created an organization like IARPA to try to take on those challenges where we can actually have the time and the resources to be able to do that on behalf of the various agencies. So the 16 elements of the intelligence community are our customers. And that means that we're doing things in the human realm, in the SIGINT realm, in the financial intelligence realm, Homeland Security, the military, uh, military intelligence disciplines of the armed services, and of course, and close to my heart, GEOINT especially. So what I want to do today is to talk a little bit about specifically the GEOINT programs. What you see here are topic areas of the things that we work on. And so the ones in blue are the ones I'm going to focus on. And specifically those, again, trying to give more attention to the ones that are ongoing now, new work, or work that is ongoing or about to start. If I had shown this slide about a year ago, I wouldn't have any of these really cool logos. So we've spent a little bit of time just trying to bring our logos up to, to, to snuff because we're working on some cool things and it's kind of hard not to have great logos to show. So the ones I want to focus on, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the ones on this slide and then I'm going to spend most time talking about Diva up in the top left and Core 3D right there in the middle. So top right, uh, right hand side, Finder was a program that we worked on that was seeking to geolocate images. 
So think of having a 50,000 kilometer square grid where you have a picture and you're trying to figure out where in this grid this picture took place. We started this research over five years ago. NGA's been a great transition partner for one of those, these programs, but it's a capability that you see a lot more now where people are helping to geolocate images, specifically those images that don't have that metadata tag. In locations around the world where people typically aren't going for touristy vacations, so those, uh, those places where people don't go a lot, we're trying to make sure we understand where, where something's happening. The two on the lower left and the lower right are all both geo geolocation programs. SLICE was about ra radio frequency signals and leverages uh, airborne SIGINT, overhead SIGINT, as well as ground-based SIGINT to help us geolocate uh, emitters. HFG specifically looks at uh, reducing the size of a target array for high frequency uh, signals. But the two I want to talk, to talk to you about today are DIVA and Core 3D, and both of those were within about the first year or two of the research program, which are about three to five year programs. Core 3D stands for the uh, creation of operationally realistic 3D environments. What's important about this is we know that for those who are seeking to go into the field, whether it's military, humanitarian, or intelligence, you often want to be able to model the area you're about to enter. And you want to be able to do that in real time as quickly as possible. The challenge is creating 3D models from satellite imagery, from LIDAR, is very time consuming, especially to get the models right. Now, a lot of times we're also trying to deal with places where we don't have the ability to fly over them with our airborne sensors, so we really are limited only to satellite imagery. So the task with this particular program was how can we take the best of satellite imagery, 2D satellite imagery, to come up with 3D models the thing that differentiates our work from that of other folks is the amount of time we're giving you. So in the beginning of the program, we're looking at maybe eight hours per kilometer square. At the end of the program, I want to be able to do a kilometer square in an hour or less, and I want to be able to do that in a very large, I want to be able to give you 100 square kilometers, and then the average is an hour or less. So very rapidly being able to come up with 3D models for our particular locations of interest to be able to support those uh, disciplines that need them. This is just an example of one of the performers in there. It's General Electric has a team that includes academia and industry. And just showing you in the course of just a couple of months between April and October of 20, 2018, what they were able to do from very, very coarse grain to very, very fine. And this is still, again, with only within the first phase of the program. And so we're still trying to bring down the time. But what we see with our partners is that to get a really good 3D model at the level of detail we want, and the one on the right is still not quite the level of detail we're looking for, it takes them on average a good five days to do a one kilometer square area. Again, we want to challenge this to bring it down to less than an hour for them, which is really going to help those operators that need to have those models very quickly, especially in denied areas. So Core 3D has come out, uh, the program manager asked these very challenging questions, and the performers, a couple of teams that are out there, are really working hard to make sure that gets done. The other research area that I want to talk to, and, and when I talk about geospatial intelligence, I have a, a slightly broader vision of it, and, and includes a lot of things. So it includes video, that, like the one you're showing here, and all the activity that's taking place in it. What we're trying to do in this case is to take advantage of the fact that there's surveillance cameras all over the world now that we want to be able to leverage, and not just forensically after something happens. I want to be able to use them in a predictive fashion to be able to say that there's activities taking place that I need some security professionals to be looking into. So in this case, we've got people loading, loading items in a truck. We have individuals walking around. We've got individuals carrying really heavy, bulky things. We want to be able to detect when people are handing off something, so someone's carrying something, and they hand it off to someone else. Or someone is in a location, like in an airport, or near an embassy, and they're carrying something that's strangely heavy for the, the normal traffic that passes around there. Something in a train station where someone goes and leaves some sort of object in, in, on the ground, and you want to make sure that someone knows. This was prompted out of the, uh, uh, the Boston Marathon bombing, and all of the video that came back to help the law, the law enforcement find out who the perpetrators were. Imagine the power of that if you could do it real time, because it actually took them going back and doing a lot of hand combing through a lot of video. We want to be able to do it in advance. Part of the reason that we take on this kind of research is the opportunity to create data sets for researchers. So that data set that you saw with all of the annotated individuals walking around, people carrying things, activity, are the types of data that we create for our programs. 
It's made available to the researchers who propose against the research problem, but it's also, generally speaking, turned over at the end of the program for all researchers to continue to working on. So even if you're not necessarily on a research team, you'll be able to take advantage of the data that we create. Recognizing as we move forward with machine learning, artificial intelligence, that we're going to need a lot of really great curated data sets, that's one of the reasons we invest in that. The other reason is that we believe in test and evaluation. So it's not enough to say that our capability does something. We want to be able to prove it. And the best way to prove it is to have really stringent data sets to allow you to actually check your work, and then to have an independent team who's always checking the work of the individuals that are creating these capabilities. In addition to programs, which are typically three to five year research opportunities, we also spend a lot of time uh, creating prize challenges. Prize challenges are a really interesting way to involve researchers, especially those who typically don't work with government, especially not with the intelligence community. We put out a really tough challenge, we put out a great data set, and whoever happens to win basically gets a check from the government. It's a pretty easy, non-contractual way to do work with the, uh, the federal government. You see a lot of organizations now starting to do prize challenges, and IARP is uh, no stranger to that. Some of that data that we create for the programs, we often put out into the world as part of prize challenges. On the one hand, to just check the work of the individuals who are, we're funding to see, is this a capability that maybe someone who's a student, hint, hint, who's a student, could potentially uh, take the data and then solve the challenge? Maybe it's someone else in industry who hasn't been part of one of these larger teams of researchers. We love the prize challenges because they get a lot of people involved to include people all over the world, people who sometimes are coming from entirely dis different disciplines, for example, that one on the lower bottom, it was called the Multi-View Stereo 3D Modeling Challenge, and we were looking at 3D point clouds from 2D imagery. Some of the individuals doing the best in that came from the medical imaging field. They were able to learn how to work with satellite imagery in the course of four to eight hours and use the tools that they had from medical imaging to apply to this particular modeling challenge. Who would have thought that some of the best researchers would be people that weren't the people that we were necessarily training to work with the satellite data. And so I encourage you, even if these areas are not your traditional field, to think about the prize challenges. I'm going to talk a little bit about the one uh, FMOW, which is Functional Map of the World on the lower left, a little bit about the UG2s up in the upper right, and then PINs, the one on the lower right, I'll tell you about because that one's about to be open and will be open for solvers. The goal behind Functional Map of the World was essentially to be able to automatically detect what a particular area of, uh, area of ground was, was, was the capabilities are for. So for example, if it's a facility, if it's a building, land, how is it being used? Can you tell that just by having trained images, or trained curated data set that actually has labeled, labeled images and be able then to automatically detect that? So as part of the data set, we had about a million annotated data points within 60 different classifications. And the winners in this case were able to very very uh, consistently pick out what particular uh, sites were. So you might look from above and it looks like a baseball field or it might look like a school or it might look like a hospital. They were able to actually be able to automatically detect that. You get the theme, a lot of automation, a lot of the ability to try to make analysts not have to use all of their time and effort focused on just identifying things. I want to be able to auto automatically identify them so that I can turn over and let them do the, the harder challenges of kind of figuring out the specifics of what's happening there. Again, this was another one that encouraged people from all over the world to come in and give their talent to it. The cool thing about this one is the data sets are still out there for Functional Map of the World and I believe for the Multi-View 3D Stereo Challenge. We encouraged open source so people were able to put their algorithms out there so those exist, exist as well. We benefited because a lot of the performers, and those are the people that were funding specifically on the programs, were able to also benefit from these prize challenge results. So if you're looking for data to be using in situations like this, please continue to look at the data that we have from our prize challenges. It's a great data source that sets that I think will continue to help improve research over years to come. The UG2s, UAVs, gliders, ground data set. Uh, and, and you'll notice the line too. This one was organized by actually by a university, University of Notre Dame. They came to us with an idea for a prize challenge, having been part of some of the prize challenges we worked on before. They were interested in having us help fund some of the prize money, as well as providing some of the data sets. And we did this in partnership with them. This was interesting. So the goal of UG2 was to try to help pre-process the data so that you could better automatically detect what was in it. It was a tough challenge. 
And it was not one that we completely solved. If you look at the lower right, we had uh, Honeywell happen to be the winners of both of the two challenges, but you see that there were uni universities as second place winners. So this isn't something where necessarily a company always wins. It really does happen to depend on who is involved. And uh, academic teams are doing really well in the prize challenges as well. Because of what we learned from this one, because we learned that it was a problem that was not yet solved, we decided to do a second one. So UG2, UG squared two, or plus, is actually ongoing now. Unfortunately, registration is closed. Uh, we already went through one round, and the individuals that won the first round are now in the second round. But the goal behind UG2 plus is, again, to build on that pre-processing step. How do you pre-process better so that you can automatically detect items, uh, items that you would actually be collecting from the ground? Prize challenges, to give you a sense, up to this one was a $50,000 prize purse. We've had some that are up to $150,000, $250,000, so there's a lot of different prize opportunities that I think are very attractive for individuals, but we just need to do a better job of getting the word out, so I hope that you will look out for our prize challenges in the future. This data set will also be made available. There's a, there's a leaderboard to kind of watch who's in the lead right now, and that leaderboard will continue after the fact. So even though you've actually missed the opening of this one, there's opportunities still to get involved. If this is the type of research you're working in, and you want to try out some of your own algorithms uh, on this particular data. The final challenge I want to highlight is called PIN, so Passive Ionospheric Non-Characterized Sounding Challenge. Whew. I have an atmospheric scientist who happens to be an NGA scientist who is on my staff as a program manager. And every time he has an opportunity, he is talking to me about the ionosphere. So hundreds of miles above the Earth, it really impacts a lot of the things that we do with respect to high frequency geolocation. It impacts aircraft, air, air traffic control. It impacts their ability to have our AM radio stations. It impacts space launch. It really impacts a lot of things despite the fact that we can't see it and most of us are not talking about it. His idea is how well can we characterize the ionosphere using sounders, and these are basically radar instruments that are already around the world, some of which are actively run and, and are used by companies and other organizations to uh, deal with the ionosphere in those particular locations. But the fact is there's a network. Can we use this network of, of sounders to be able to, to characterize the ionosphere wherever we need it, to, wherever we need it, wherever we need to? So he'll be creating, um, putting out interesting data sets that have sounder readings and looking for whoever has experience and expertise in this area to try to come forward and try to characterize the ionosphere. So this is going to help benefit not only this particular challenge, but the research that we're doing on geo geolocation in general. So again, you see a theme. The prize challenges help with our more general research. They try to get researchers involved who maybe are not on the larger teams that we do with our programs. But again, these are things that are really important to us and have great data sets for those of you who are in research and want to try uh, your hand at trying to solve a great challenge that's been out there for a while. So stay tuned. PINS opens probably within the next month or so. And I think it's going to be an interesting one that I think, I know I for sure plan to learn a lot from that one. I mentioned uh, the open opportunities, not a lot right now. However, upcoming PINS prize challenge, and then we have two programs on AI security one of which has to deal with uh, what we call Trojans in artificial intelligence data. So we know that those of you who are working with artificial intelligence and dealing with algorithms know that a lot of our trained algorithms are trained on data that's not controlled. So these are big, big data sets that are curated from around the world. People may slip training data in there that actually tries to teach your algorithm to do something or recognize something that you don't want it to do or recognize. Because we're also relying on these within the intelligence community, we know that there's a vulnerability here, and we know that we want to make sure that we can catch at the earliest possible opportunity the fact that I've got some of this data in there, these Trojans in there that are just waiting for the right trigger. So Troj AI is focused on that one. Sales has to do with protecting the information that's in the training data itself so that no one can go in and, for example, if it's a database of people, figure out who may be in the training data sets, who are the individuals that are our targets that happen to be out there. So two programs that are opening in the next couple of months uh, for having their broad agency announcements, looking for teams of researchers to work on those. So if any of those have been your, in your area of expertise, take a look. We will also have coming out, I think, within the next month, within the next, maybe within the next week, a draft broad agency announcement that's more in the uh, satellite imagery analysis area. So again, take a look at that one, because we're starting to do a lot more with small, sat small satellites as well as doing more with the data that's available. 
to current opportunities that are requests for information. And so we do request for information when we're asking individuals, what is the state of the art capabilities? What is your company, your school? What do you, what do you do? What is your area of expertise that can contribute to this question? There's one right now that's open on innovations in small satellites. So if you've got an idea for a small satellite, something that's not been flown before by someone else, take a look at the RFI and consider submitting. Uh, there's no guarantee that the programs will come out of the RFIs, but we use that information, and sometimes they do lead to programs down the road. My final slide, I think, is a little bit more about how to engage with us. So I've talked about the RFIs. I've talked a little bit about prize challenges and research programs. The other opportunity is something called a seedling. And generally speaking, we have one of these opportunities. It's a broad agency announcement that has a laundry list of areas that we're interested in at IARPA. And we're looking for people with interesting proposals. The goal behind the seedling is to take an, a research idea that is sort of so, you're just not sure if it's really something that's going to work or not. And you probably need nine to 12 months of study to figure that out. So the seedling helps bring an idea, which we say, from disbelief to doubt. So let's push it just far enough along that we know that there's something there that deserves future research. Seedlings are a great opportunity to do that. The BAA, the Broad Agency Announcement for Seedlings, should open, I'm hoping, by the end of this next quarter coming up, so before even the fall. So take a look at those opportunities. Those ideas come from you. They come from industry. They come from academia. They come from individuals who just have a great idea that happens to be in an area that we're interested in investing. So I hope I've explained a little bit about IARPA. Again, I hope through the thread you've seen the importance of working with industry, working with academia. We can't do any of this on our own, and we need the best of talent, wherever that talent may reside, to make sure that we're getting innovative thought, creative ideas and solutions for some of the most tough, difficult challenges that are solvable by science and technology. I think at this point I've left more than enough time for questions, and I'm going to move over here to the handy dandy app and see whether anyone has uh, put anything in here. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I have a couple here. How do we measure and assess return on investment? How do you use that ROI to prioritize the work that you're doing? Thank you for that question. As a research organization, it can be difficult to, especially one that's dealing with things that are sort of five and 10 years out and sometimes longer, it can be difficult to actually have that ROI. Because we've been around for about 12 years now, we're actually able to go back and see how the capabilities that we delivered to our intelligence partners, so to the agencies themselves, how they're using them operationally. They're able to share their success stories with us, and we're compiling a list of those kinds of success stories, which happen to be much better and more interesting on the classified side. But for those that we can describe in an unclassified way, we've started putting those actually on our website. So being able to seriously impact the way that a particular agency handles its mission in whatever the field it may be is how we measure our success. And I think looking at that track record over the years, it's been very exciting to see the types of things that we've been involved in. The other way that I think um, I like to measure it is in the interactions we have with the agencies. 12 years ago when IARPA was created, IARPA was taken from a handful of agencies. So we took resources, we took money, and we took people. That was, did not make us a very popular organization if you can imagine that. So knowing where we were and how we were basically having to fight for our existence and knowing where we are now, where we're seen as a valued partner, a trusted partner who can take on interesting, or interesting challenges and then deliver capability that makes a difference, that's how I assess the return on investment. And that's what we share with our oversight partners, whether on the Hill or within the larger office of the Director of National Intelligence. That's the message we share with mission partners that we want to work with to give them a sense of what we may be able to do for them. How do we use that to prioritize the work? It's interesting, and I'll, I'll do this sort of, this is my shameless plug. IARPA is, uh, like, like DARPA, we have a model of bringing in program managers who are term limited. So individuals come in from industry, academia, other government agencies for, from three to five years. They come in with an idea, something that they've been working on for, throughout their career, something that they happen to be an expert in, but just have been lacking the resources and the time to really focus on the harder, the harder challenges, the ones that need more time and attention. Those individuals come, and that's really how our great ideas come. They, they come with the individuals. So it's not that I start the year with a list of priorities from the agencies. I know a number of things that they want us to work on. But if I don't have a good person to lead that, a good program manager, then the, the idea just won't come to fruition. 
So having a great person with a great idea is how we prioritize the research. And typically speaking, we then get the input from the agencies as to if we're successful, are they willing, is this something that they'd be willing to operationalize? And generally speaking, we've gotten great feedback that way. What is an example of a potentially disruptive technology that the U.S. should invest in to maintain its competitive advantage against potential adversaries? I think we are investing in a number of those things now. I mean, whether it is really trying to figure out where does artificial intelligence and machine learning, how is that going to impact the intelligence community? How is that really going to impact us more globally? How does it impact society? How is it going to impact commercial entities? Um, we also are doing research in quantum computing. You know, if there's going to be a quantum computer, we want to make sure that we're there in the front forefront, understanding the challenges to get there and then what it can be used. Uh, one of my other areas that I, I think that we're investing in now and I'm seeing a lot more investment is the biosecurity area. We know that gene editing is out there. We know that there are opportunities to uh, create organisms and that are toxic, organisms that can really devastate a population, whether through agriculture or through water supplies or what have you. We need to know when these things are entering our community. We need to know when they're entering the United States so we can protect against them. So these are areas that we're already working in that I, we need, definitely need to con uh, continue to work in. If you look at the intelligence disciplines in general, we want to generally know at the earliest possible opportunity that something is coming that's a threat so that we can work with our defense components and they can protect against it. So we can know that there's something coming here that we can protect against so we know how to prepare society, prepare communities, prepare whoever, prepare the government to be able to handle those threats. And so the more that we can invest in getting more lead time, the sooner we know that something's happening, the sooner we can prepare for it and actually start working towards protecting ourselves. And the phone locked. Does IARPA have a relationship with the IC organic R&D organizations such as NGA Research? Yes, we do. I'm excited to be an NGA employee myself who's now leading IARPA. My uh, incoming deputy, which was just announced literally uh, last week, is uh, Kathy Cattell, who is going to be my de deputy director for research. So it's another person who's spent a number of, uh, she spent a number of years now in NGA research. I have one program manager who comes from NGA research, and we're in the process of recruiting another one. Uh, with the respect to the other agencies, we do have detailees that are coming from some of the other intelligence agencies as well. So mainly the larger ones. We're trying to cultivate relationships with some of the smaller ones, but right now we've got at least three of the big five represented on staff. They help because they bring problems that are unique to the agencies themselves and help us to know what some of those priorities are. They bring the skill set and experience of working on challenges real time. Uh, that they can then bring, uh, bring it for a research project and help us to make sure that we're taking on the ones that are gonna make a difference to the analysts and other researchers that are working there. So yes, we have a great relationship with them now. Who is identifying the problems and programs that IARPA is addressing? Thankfully, we are. Uh, how the programs prioritize? Same sort of question. I think when I talk to other organizations and they start talking about the list of requirements, um, I shy away from that. Um, and only because with an advanced research organization whose focus is far out into the future as we try to focus, if we're too requirements driven, we may not be focused on the right things. We need to know what the priorities are to make sure that if we have capabilities on hand that we've created in the past that can be leveraged differently for those particular uh, areas, that we can do that. But I prefer to have the maximum flexibility to be able to work on the things that aren't necessarily ones that the agencies would say, that's my number one right there. Sometimes what we work on is so disruptive to their current operations and their current mission that if we were to let them choose, they might not have picked that one. For example, we were one of the earlier organizations to start looking at openly available information in social media and what intelligence you could derive from that. But I think at the time when we asked if agencies were interested in that, they weren't exactly interested in it. I think now there's a lot more investment in it because there's a realization that there's a lot of power in all of that information. But early on, people weren't quite so sure about that. So having the flexibility to be able to invest in areas that aren't necessarily obvious ones for the intelligence community, uh, I think that's the kind of flexibility organizations like IARPA need. We then work hand in hand with the other research organizations because typically our transition is into other research organizations that have great relationships with their operational counterparts within their agencies. They know how to get the capabilities inside that can then be transitioned to operations, and so we need partners in both of those areas. You guys are great with the questions. 
Do we struggle with not invented here among, among our client organizations or with legacy programs who are resistant to new approaches? If so, how do you work against that? Not directly. I think because we work so closely with the research organizations within agencies that they know better how to uh, communicate inside what our capabilities are going to do for others. They're able to then work with those in the operational areas to help them see, sort of paint that picture of how a new capability can actually change their mission and enable them to do it more efficiently or effectively. So we have not had that problem here with the not, not invented here. And I think that's also the strength of the relationship that's been built with the science and technology organizations, generally speaking, within the uh, intelligence community. We have great interactions with each other. We uh, regularly reach out to each other and or have the ability to share what's happening. So because I'm not competing with them, because I'm not duplicating the research that they are doing in-house, what I'm doing is complementary. I think we're able to not have that run into that not invented here problem because they see us as an ally, they see us as someone who can contribute to as opposed to compete with them. Does, uh, has IARPA done research into machine translation of foreign languages? Yes, we have. I don't know if that was a planted question, but I appreciate it. We have spent a lot of time actually looking at not only uh, first speech recognition, so the idea of being able to recognize if you have a sound clip that the language is a particular one, so then you can then get it to someone who can triage it. So we know that there's a lot of automatic translators out there for uh, very commonly used, I would say, uh, languages with commercial, uh, commercial business processes behind them. So a lot of the ones in the world where it makes sense from a commercial perspective to be able to have a translator. But for the smaller languages that are not spoken by many people in the world, who may not even have much of a digital footprint, frankly, uh, you don't see a lot of investment in those areas. And so those low resource languages are ones that are our sweet spot. We have created training data sets where with having a couple of hours of training data set that maybe it takes a week, about a week to, uh, the goal was a week, to train the model itself, we're able to recognize and then transcribe these low re lower resource languages, which has made a great deal to mission partners who are dealing more with those kind of signals. So on the same token, now we're trying to come up with a system to actually not only be able to translate them, but say you're an analyst who does not speak that particular language, but you have a corpus of information. So you've got media, whether it's written, you've got digital, you've got voice tracks, you've got some online things, and you want to be able to ask a question of that particular database, but you don't speak the language. So we're trying to be able to translate your question into whatever the date language is that's in there and get you back an answer in the language of your choice, so in English, for an English speaker, to be able to know what's in there. So yes, we do a lot with that, and machine learning has made such a huge impact to that particular area of machine translation uh, that it's, it's been very exciting to see what the, the abilities have been. And being able to train these data sets or train on the data sets in such a short period of time has been very exciting as well. Ah, gosh, I feel like someone's reading our website. Um, what's IARPA's relationship with other similar agencies like the Brain Initiative, ERDC, DARPA, et cetera? Are there collaborative efforts going on or duplicate efforts or investments being made? And then I'll sort of jump in this, compare your work with that of DARPA. Is there overlap? And I'm sorry, I'll just drop this one as too. And how about InQtel? Okay. So we were created to be like DARPA. Our first two directors actually had firsthand experience as program managers or senior advisors at DARPA. So a lot of what we do from the beginning, our foundation is like DARPA. Our current, uh, our current relationship with DARPA is very good. Uh, at the program manager level, they know the people that are working in their same discipline, and they talk a lot. They're on each other's source selections. They keep up with each other's accomplishments, whether it's reading through, through reading papers or even coming to some of the site visits and knowing firsthand and seeing what each other, each other is able to accomplish. So great relationship with DARPA at the working level. Um, former IARPA director, Peter Heinem, is now the deputy director of DARPA, so Peter was a boss of mine have a great relationship with them at the leadership level as well. The duplication, again, our goal is not to do something others are doing, whether that's another government agency or even really industry. If there's already someone working on it who we have, we believe has a chance of success, we don't need to get in there. What we look for are those gaps, those sort of hard problems that no one seems to be trying to solve that's gonna make a difference between being able to have this capability ability available and not. And so when we find something like that, we're gonna invest in it. I'll give you an example. Superconducting electronics. We know that there's a lot of supercomputers out there, but they tend to be these really large things that are maybe the national labs and some really large organizations have. 
we decided we wanted to see if we can make some components for superconducting computing to try to make it more, uh, have, give it more of a commercial opportunity. So we invested in having uh, superconducting tools that'll help you design the components that you need, the cabling that you need to actually move data from room temperature up to cryo, cryo levels. So just the components that we didn't see a lot of individuals or little individual organizations um, investing in. Not that we can take credit for all of that, but our investments are helping to spur industry to realize that there is a desire in government for these types of things. And so now there are industries that are taking off and continuing the work and going forward. We still have some investments in those areas, but those are the types of things where we feel like we can really make a difference. Po focusing industry to know that this is something that government would appreciate if industry invested in, funding them to get through some of the harder challenges and hurdles that exist before them, and then letting them ride. And you know, at that point, government is able to purchase as a service or as a capability something from someone that's then developed it. InQtel. InQtel is a great part of that sort of research continuum. They tend to invest more in that sort of six to, I would say, maybe up to 18 months as a stretch opportunity, so something that already exists that maybe can be commercialized in that period of time. Again, our researchers are talking, so those that are working at InQtel and looking at all of these innovative companies uh, are familiar with the companies that come out of IARPA investments. IARPA researchers are also looking at InQtel uh, individuals and employees who work there to help us know the types of capabilities that might be ones that aren't, uh, that don't know about IARPA, that aren't, aren't aware of the abilities and opportunities we have for funding. And so there's def definitely a good conversation there, but they tend to be on the, the shorter end of the timeline, whereas we're on the longer end of the timeline, but we do have a common, common, common goals in some cases and definitely have conversations about those emerging areas of technology. All right, I think that might have been the last one. I know, isn't it? It's kind of interesting. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy for you guys who, who answered questions, and I hope that I was able to answer those. I did want to just, since I have a couple minutes, to say one a couple things. And this came up earlier in one of the other panels, and I, I like the way um, Jack Dangerman answered it. It really hurt my heart to see people working for a large tech company out west not want to do work with the Department of Defense. And the same token, individuals who don't necessarily want to do work with the intelligence community. Um, and maybe because I've been in as long as I've been in, it seems very obvious to me that if we don't have access to all the talented individual, individuals in this country to help solve these national security problems, then we're in trouble. That we're not going to maintain our technological advantage, and we're not going to maintain that lead. We can't compel people to do it, and I don't, wouldn't want to be able to compel people to do it. I just don't always understand when, the, when it's such a resistance to doing that kind of work. So I'm happy to see so many people in here, and I hope, you know, should you have these thoughts or should you know people in your communities, peers, who have these thoughts, press them on it a little bit. Because I just don't think people have sort of thought it through. Um, not every technology necessarily has a uh, offensive application, but so many of them now are dual use, it's kind of hard to say, well, I'll work on this and not that. The fact of the matter is we need the talent, we need the people helping to solve our problems because that's what's happening with our, our peer competitors or adversaries or whoever they happen to be. And we're going to be behind if we don't have access to all of that, that good talent. So um, that's sort of my two cents there. It wasn't asked as a question, but I wanted to make sure that I brought that out because it's something that I worry about as someone that needs a lot of STEM talent. When I see things like that, I just, I, it's hard to envision a really positive future when I see people not wanting to work with us. Thankfully, IARPA's challenges are so interesting that either they, people don't care because they're like, this is really interesting work, I'm gonna work with these folks, or maybe for whatever reason, we're, we're not having the same sort of opposition right now. And I hope that continues to be the case, um, but I just always wanted to seed that conversation because I don't think it's, it's me necessarily convincing people. Uh, if they already have a, uh, dislike or distrust of the government, having someone from the government have the conversation with them isn't going to help. But if a peer or someone they trust in industry or just someone in academia has that conversation with them, maybe, just maybe, they'll hear it. So I invite you to be part of that solution, to get your peers uh, who may not be interested in working with government to know that there's some great opportunities 
that a career in public service really is an interesting one and a worthy one. And um, you know, think about what you can do to kind of be part of that. So I'm going to stop now. And uh, thank you very much for your time and energy. I hope I've uh, explained IARPA to you and made you excited about some of the things that we're working on and that we have some uh, participants, whether through programs or prize challenges, from St. Louis University in the future. So thank you very much. That was terrific, uh, Stacy. Thank you very much, Dr. Dixon, for that um, presentation. And the, uh, the really amazing way you blew through those questions, that was fantastic. Um, really put the rest of us to shame who've been trying to deal with that all, all day long. Um, the holistic worldview, advanced analytics, and predictive tools is the subject of our next conversation. Uh, a terrific lineup for you to meet, including Andy Deering, who is the interim president of Planet Federal, and he is going to lead this panel and tell you more about the people that he's talking with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, so I would like to welcome up my panel here. Um, so first off, I would like to uh, bring forward um, Dr. Uh, or sorry, sorry um, Sue Cowate, Ms. Sue Cowate from NGA. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> She's the director of analysis. Uh, my next panelist is Dr. Charlie Clymer, who's the assistant professor for the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science from the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And uh, my next panelist, uh, we've got the Honorable Jeff Harris, who is the chairman of USGIF. And we also have Mr. Robert Shelton, Jr. He is the chief technology officer and advisor for Microsoft's National Intelligence Division. Thank you. So as a plug, too, remember we, have, we will be doing questions via the app, so uh, as we begin the discussion here, uh, please, please use that application to submit your, your questions here. Um, but first off, I'd like to thank you for having me here, and thank you for having our panelists here. Um, I'm really and truly excited to be here at St. Louis University. This is a place that I call home. Uh, many years ago, I, I graduated from Parks College right down at McDonnell Douglas Hall. and. Uh, and for me personally, uh, getting into the geospatial industry was very non-traditional. Um, but having been in the geospatial industry for the past 16 years um, and dealing with some of the data challenges as you've heard throughout the day, throughout the, day, throughout the week, um, we have more data than we can, we can work with. And so these smart folks here that are a lot smarter than me are figuring out ways to deal with those data challenges and, and learning how to make sense of that. And so I'm really excited to dig in with each one of them on, on how they are applying that, how they're learning and doing research, how they've seen the industry change and what commercial tools and solutions are, are being built. Um, so I will start by asking Sue. Uh, so it was stated by the former director of NGA, uh, Robert Cardillo, that six million imagery analysts are needed to keep up with the workload created by the volume of data flowing through the government and commercial satellite means. Uh, have, now being part of Planet Labs, we are an active contributor to that challenge. Um, so can you share with the group how your organization is embracing technology to not only handle the current demand, but using machine learning or artificial intelligence to solve tomorrow's challenges? Yeah, Andy, that's a great question, and I really appreciate you asking. And if we can get my first slide, my only slide, uh, up, that would be great. And I'm really glad to be able to have the opportunity to provide some insights, actually, into how we do our business. I know in particular in academia, both whether you're a professor or a student, you're kind of wondering what's behind that veil. So I'm going to lift the veil just a little bit and share with you some of the basic blocking and tackling of what we do. And shown there, almost 50% of what my human analysts do every day is what's called monitoring the known knowns, monitoring known locations of known types of activity. So you can think about that as watching submarine bases. And are the submarines there or are they gone? The surface ships there or are they gone? 
And this is really critical to our nation's security that we do this type of monitoring. But I have almost 50% of my really smart and talented creative analysts looking at the known knowns. And I contrast that with go diagonally across the quarter into the discover area, which is where the black swans happen, the Arab Springs, the 9-11s. And only 9% of my workforce has the time to do that, to do the real surprises, the things that, if it happens, are just game changers in our lives. And then when you look at the other really critical and highly cognitive areas of search, that is looking for activity that we know about but we don't know where it's happening, and we'll use uh, drug labs in Latin America as an example. I, I know what makes them up, but I don't know where they all are, and so I'm searching for them. Or in the research area, where I'm looking at a place that I anticipate a certain type of activity to happen, but all of a sudden, somebody or something shows up, and I'm like, why is that? What's going on? And those are the real key questions that we need to provide to whether it's our policymakers, whether it's our operators, the military, any of our customers in understanding what to anticipate, what to expect, what to prepare for. That's where I want our cognitive work to be. But right now, I'm sort of stuck in doing a whole lot of monitoring the known known. So as we're looking to where computer vision, automation, artificial intelligence is going to help us, first and foremost, it's about putting the machine to work in that known known area, right? Where the human machine team is more machine, less human in monitoring the known known. And that provides me the opportunity to then take my smart, talented, creative, innovative analysts and have them do the research, have them do the searching, have them do the discovery, the anticipatory intelligence about what really matters and where not only cognitive insights matter, but also collaborating and working with diverse people of different backgrounds, different skills, bringing other kinds of information into the analytics. That's the power of what we need to bring to our customers. And that's where the human machine team is more human enabled with the machine. So we see the machine working in everywhere. We see the humans working everywhere. And what we want is to really enable the cognitive, collaborative, interdisciplinary uh, activity of humans to be put against the harder problem sets and the machines against the more mundane. mundane. No, that's great. Thank, thank you, Sue, for that. I think um, that seems to be the uh, concern that most people have about, you know, machine learning or are the machines going to do all the work of the humans and where do the humans interact with that? Um, I, I think a nice segue for that is, um, and, and for uh, Dr. Clymer, is, you know, in We've heard many mentions about data science and research throughout the morning sessions that we've had here. Um, and based on your work at, uh, at the university, what area of research do you feel is untapped in, or relatively untapped in, in data science that you're working on? Um, so we've got a lot of combinatorial problems here, huge data and a whole lot of um, really difficult problems. And using artificial intelligence and statistics, uh, we can find solutions to these problems. So I was using artificial intelligence methods for many, many years. But I always bug me because I thought, is there a better solution in there that I'm not finding? You know, these solutions are approximate. We don't know what the real optimal solution is. And so it's, it's really, um, but you know, the problem's so huge. How could you possibly find optimal solution when you have this, these huge data sets and, and these very high complexity problems? Um, you're all familiar with, I assume, about the combinatorial explosion. You know, when you're looking at combinations, they just shoot, skyrocket really, really quickly, and it makes it non-computational um, uh, tractable. Um, so um, if I could go to the next bullet there, please. Um, there's one area, uh, one problem, a famous problem called a traveling salesman problem. It's a, a combinatorial problem that's been very well studied. And they've actually had really great success finding the optimal solution to this problem. Um, they've solved a problem that has 85,900 cities, which has, um, if you can read that, that's 10 raised to 306,000 something. 
feasible solutions, and they found the one optimal solution out of all of those feasible solutions. And so it is possible we could improve on our accuracy using these optimal methods, um, but so far there's been very, very little done in this area for general problems, traveling salesman problem. Um, even there's a lot of types of traveling salesman problems that still, like 50 cities, that can't be solved. This is, uh, this was very well focused on this particular type of traveling salesman problem where the distances were symmetric and where was a Euclidean distance. And um, so the problem is, is that how do, you, how do you make this more general? How do you find ways to be able to optimally solve really huge problems that are, that are more general problems that we're facing today? Um, one opportunity is, well, our labs are working on this, and we're looking at using supercomputers. So we need, we have this incredible amount of supercomputing power. Um, right now, the United States has the most powerful supercomputer in the world. It might change pretty fast, <laughs> it goes really quickly. But we're able to compute 10 to the 18 computations per second. And we think that there's 10 to the 17, it's estimated 10 to the 17 seconds since the Big Bang. 10 to the 18 is a, a really big number. Per second, they're able to compute that many computations per second. It's a, just mind-boggling what we can do. What we need to do, though, is we need to look at these algorithms that we're using for solving these problems and figure out how we can parallelize these across all these many, many processors. And that's what's kind of holding us back right now, but that's what we're working on. And I think that's where we have an opportunity to, to improve. Great, thank you. So, so Jeff, I have, a, I have a question for you. So talking about the predictive side of, of uh, this panel discussion, um, there's an old adage about predicting the future is a fool's errand. Um, so based on all the variabil variability that can be accounted for, um, and I think weather is a great example, right? We still have not been able to perfect that algorithm yet. So, but many organizations are stating that they are developing algorithms and platforms, you've heard of some today, that they can predict the future events or future scenarios. So in, in your opinion, do you feel like society will be able to predict the future through technology? And if not, what barriers need to be overcome and how do we get closer to this panacea? It's amazing. Andy, how we take a new technology and we bring it in and it changes all the old rules. And, and, and so we've been predicting the future long before we had a computer and we'll continue to predict the future. And in the, in the hunt for October, we're on the control room on board the sub and the CIA analyst is trying to get the attention and he said, on the bottom of the hour, he's gonna turn to starboard because he's gonna do a crazy Ivan and at the end of the movie, he said, well, how do you know he's going to turn? Well, you weren't believing the thing I was saying, so I had a 50-50 chance of getting it right. <laughs> and, and when we present intelligence to decision makers, you know, we always present, here's what we know, here's what we don't know and would like to know, back to Sue's comment, and then here's what you think. And if you go to the doctor, it's take two aspirins and go to take two aspirins and call me in the morning because here's what I think. I'm not quite sure what you have, but aspirin and a glass of water is a pretty good, pretty good remedy. So we as tribal humans don't manage risk very well because it's hard to put it in perspective. And, and, and so as a researcher, if I add data to a problem, it illuminates the problem in interesting ways, and it changed the characterization of the null hypothesis, and often it allows you to see something differently. And, and so Stacy spoke a, a lot to the future of, of quantum computing. Uh, I've been watching closely uh, quantum optimizers, and Volkswagen's done some very interesting research to where they take 5,000 simultaneous taxi cabs in Beijing and does a heat map for route optimization. And the computer says, hey, if all you want to do is optimize this, this is actually pretty straightforward. And to your point, when you visualize it, all of a sudden you say, well, that's pretty cool. Um, and we're all picking up ways right now, much to the uh, chagrin of people in Arlington who never had a car down their street until Waze decided that was the best path between point A and point B. Because Waze is just taking some data out for a ride and says, while you're all sitting in traffic, I'm going to go do some optimization that goes something different. So it's our tribal nature, I think, Andy, that causes it to be a panacea. 
And I said, look, give me more data. Give me more noisy data. I have a way in a computer to separate out wheat and chaff in order to go discover something. So I'm a satellite kind of guy. And we have these satellites that we launched to orbit. And they're, they're wonderful machines, but they can be finicky. And when they're finicky, they'll have an ailment, and they sort of incorrectly predict what they're doing. But they sort of say, you know, I'm a little out of operation for what I'm doing. And we have people that do trend analysis on computers. They, they live in the data in, in order to be astute as to something going on. And if you come home at 10.30 at night when your curfew was at 9.30, mom is very astute on the very first sentence that comes out of your mouth, whether it's true or false. And you learn early on that her data set's actually better than yours. <laughs> And, and, and so the satellite is sort of saying, I'm having this problem, and we build a data set over time. And, and, and one of my best examples was we had a, a, a high-powered component on the transmit section that was getting a current drift that was unusual. And the government, in all its brilliance, had stopped paying for trend analysis on the satellites because it wasn't worth having people look at the data to see if you could coax something out of the data. And so it was a Sunday afternoon, and a 26-year-old's looking at the trend analysis on his own time at a desk and says, you know, this trending of this would be bad. He called the manufacturer of the subset, and on a Sunday afternoon, they convinced the two of them, convinced the federal government to take this national asset offline. Because had they not taken it offline, it had about 47 hours worth of life left. It was some small number, 157. And, 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 and I naturally got, the, got a phone call that said, this is a big problem because we spent all this money for the satellite. It's not going to work very long. I said, well, given that we now know the trend analysis, let's just go change, change the assumptions about how we operate the satellite. And I recall calling my, my successor at the, at the NRO and said, this is easy. But just by changing a couple of the assumptions, we're going to take it from a satellite that may not last a month to one that will run out of fuel six or eight years from now just because we spotted in the data some noise that we otherwise wouldn't want to do. And so the good news is, as Sue pointed out, we have these algorithms that are really good saying, you know, I've watched this bank for a long time, and I see a signature now that we've not quite ever seen before. We have three terrorists in the 9-11 attack that all share the same phone number. Is that of interest to anybody? So 30 years ago, when we did an analysis of CIA's top 10 intelligence failures, we said, these are the one the intelligence community are most embarrassed about. And on every single one, back then 30 years ago, we found in the data something that would have allowed us to answer the panacea and predict. So when you know what you're looking for, the answer's there. And so the question is, can we coax the computers to have mere mortals pull this stuff out? Great. Thank you. So. We were talking a lot about buzzwords, uh, AI, machine learning, um, and Robert, you're, you get to sit on a lot of these technology panels, and you can't go to a lot of those without those words being discussed. But you know, many people also tend to affiliate those AI and machine learning in a, in a negative way, uh, Skynet, how, those sorts of things. So um, from your perspective at, at Microsoft, what tools are truly making a positive impact through the adoption of AI and machine learning to help organizations solve those real world problems? Well, anyone who's tried to deliver a system to the government knows that Skynet would never get through the two year ATO process. <laughs> <laughs> it would give up and the uh, CISO would turn it down anyway. So there's no risk of Skynet taking over the government. Um, from a tools perspective, actually, uh, I didn't do my homework, so if we could go to Sue's uh, slide, uh, I think it was the first one uh, after the introduction, that, uh, this will sort of point to um, the importance of, of where the tools are going to go. I don't, I don't know if that's possible or not uh, from the slides here, but um, there are a lot of tools for data scientists. Um, there's the R programming language, there are data science, uh, 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 tool sets, desktops, virtual machines. Um, there, are, uh, there are notebooks for data scientists and a lot, a lot of great technology. And companies like Microsoft is producing more and more every day. 
Um, but when you think about it, that only targets like 0.001% of the population, uh, of which I am not. I, I only play data scientist on TV. Um, the rest of the population actually uses tools like Excel and Word, PowerPoint, search engines. Until we get to a point where the AI is ubiquitous in those types of tools, it's going to be a little difficult for the analysts to find real value. Right? I mean, on the internet, if you do a, a search for uh, toilet paper, or let's say golf clubs, maybe golf clubs, um, everyone knows that in your Facebook feed, in your, uh, all your social media feeds, your, Google will make sure that every known brand of golf club shows up in your social feed. How'd that happen? Right? When you do a search on a certain, I, I was going to say Bing, but I didn't want to make you guys laugh, so I'll say Google. Um, when you do certain searches on, on, on popular websites, as you're typing the, the words out, it is predicting what you're going to search for next, right? Um, if you're using some of the office tools, some of the web uh, cloud-based ones, um, like PowerPoint and, and our tool, Office 365, you can speak in English and have it real-time translate to some 60 languages using uh, speech-to-text translation. Those are ways that AI are built into the things that we're using today. Now, in, Su in Sue's slide, she showed, I forget what the percentage was, uh, the amount of time that people are doing monitoring. It was some really high percentage. I can't remember what it was. On, in the regular world, that's not how it works, right? Uh, if you tell, depending on what tool you're using, something you're looking for, um, take Twitter. These are the things that I'm interested in. Twitter will happily deliver that information to you on demand, probably more than you want it, right? But yet, in other parts, the most important part of the, the uh, in, my, in my opinion, as a US citizen, I don't want to speak Mandarin, so I'm hopeful that the uh, IC will be successful in preventing that, to have that much of the analyst time spent monitoring something that a computer could do is astonishing. It's not a good thing. Um, I'll tell you up front, as a computer scientist myself and a recovering developer, computers are not that smart, right? I kind of think of them like, uh, actually, dogs are smarter than, than, than computers. Um, however, if you teach a computer how to hunt, it'll hunt all day long, never sleeps, right? If you tell it what you're looking for, you should only have to do that once, and then it should start alerting you. The, the true value of AI is not the Skynet scenario. AI is at best where we are today. I mean, there is general AI, the, the singularity that might happen sometime in the future, hopefully the day after I expire. Um, but today, all AI is, or should be, is a way to enhance the human to be able to do more. And if the brilliance of the human is spent monitoring and searching for information that they monitored and searched for yesterday, then we have a problem. And so um, although the tools for the data scientist and the AI developer are getting better every day, it's not until the tools that the analysts use every day gets better that we will truly find value in things like machine learning. And so I, I really appreciate uh, Sue's uh, uh, slide. And I, I, I agree with her 100% that, uh, that not enough time is being spent in the discovery um, part of uh, uh, analysis, and way too much time is spent in the uh, monitoring and searching for things that you monitored for yesterday. Great, thank you. So taking some of the questions in from the app, uh, so the first question or the highest ranking one here we have is for you, Sue. So what, uh, what qualities does NGA analysis and specifically value when recruiting people? I love this question because it's about the humans. Curiosity, creativity, innovative spirit, desire to be part of a team and work with others who are different and like you. That's the kind of people that we need and that we want and that truly brings value to our mission. Great. And knowing that there's a lot of students sitting in the audience uh, and some of them being maybe non-traditional, maybe they're in data science or maybe they are in geography, or maybe they're in the aviation science program like I was and getting new into this, this realm of what we're talking about here. Um, 
Dr. Clymer, what do you think is the first, you know, the, the first step that they should take or what you would do to encourage students to learn more about this confluence of uh, technology and AI and machine learning to, to be that next wave of professionals that we have here helping solve some of these mission problems? Take classes. <laughs> There's a lot of really great classes. Um, if, in fact, our um, so we just last week I think came out with a new uh, bachelor's degree in computing technology, which is um, it's geared to be to provide a, a more broad background to students in the current technologies and tools that are out there. A lot of flexibility in the degree. And so, you know, by going and, and, and actually experiencing some of these classes and learning about the, the, um, the, what's out there to be offered. So I have a, a biological data science class, and um, tomorrow we're taking eight students to the Midwest Bioinformatics Conference where they're presenting their posters on a project they just started this semester. You know, it's a one, one semester project, and they are just jumping right into it, learning about real problems right now in, in biological data science, and the students are great. They are so creative. They come up with these really great creative solutions, and they're hardworking, and just, and they put it all together, and we just got our posters off this morning to FedEx. <laughs> it's, um, I would strongly recommend just, you know, get, getting your feet wet, taking the classes, and seeing, seeing how you like it. Uh, if you don't mind, I, no, I'd absolutely. like to build on that. So when students come to me and say, well, what do I need to study to come work at NGA to be an analysis or source or, or wherever, I tell them, study what you're passionate about. Because what you want to do is learn how to learn. Learn how to be curious. Learn how to work with others who know something different from you that will add to your learning and knowledge. It's really fascinating when we go uh, at, at our morning Ops Intel briefing and you know we're at, asked if you're the briefer, tell us a little bit about your background, tell us something interesting about yourself. And the vast array of experiences and degrees and knowledge and insight that comes out is truly the diversity that makes up and weaves together to make our mission successful. So yeah, getting a, a political science or a data science or an IT degree you know, has some direct applicability, but quite frankly, um, marine biology, if you learn to question, you know, in the sciences and you learn to think how to continue to dig and, and bring other information together is ultimately what we want and we'll help train you with some of the skills and knowledge that you might need for the specifics of how we do our job, but it's really hard to train you how to think well and that's what the education, I think, brings. Yeah. Now this, I'm going to open this up to the panel. So current tools, sensors, and data are optimized for human interaction and, and analysis. So what shifts in software, hardware, and data do you think we can expect to see with the growing emphasis on machine inter, inter, interpretability over human interpretability? Go ahead, Mr. Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is, is the nerd up here. Okay. Um. <laughs> Well, actually, I guess on this stage, maybe the com I should say computer nerd. Um, <laughs> so from a software perspective, one of the things that you're going to see, um, I believe, is that, and we're already uh, seeing this uh, in, the, in the area of AI, uh, I would say both Google and Microsoft on a very large scale uh, company um, side are doing a lot of research around um, having AI that is self-taught versus human taught. Um, I think it was the, the first version of Google's DeepMind that beat the Go champion was, um, I forget the number of hours they, that they put into that to have humans train it on how to, how to do that, which is incredibly impressive. Uh, version 2.0 beat version 1.0 and it did it within like 30 days. And it was self-taught versus uh, human taught and it played version 1.0 until it could beat it. Right? And a month in computer time is like forever. So I, I think what you're going to see in the way of, from the software perspective, is there is going to be an increasing um, uh, versioning of capabilities. And the un unfortunate part for the government is, um, you know, government has a tendency to be behind commercial industry as it is, and sometimes in, in, in terms of years. 
um, as the speed of uh, innovation increases on the outside, uh, it makes it a little harder for the, the U.S. government to keep up. And I will tell you that China doesn't have a FAR. They don't have acquisition rules, right? They use everything. Um, and they have no privacy rules. I heard their conversation about privacy earlier. They don't have the same qualms about privacy that we, we do in Europe does. So um, they don't concern themselves with how someone might feel about the fact that they were picked up on facial recognition. So I think you're going to see, especially coming out of uh, countries like that, you're going to see innovation that will, um, it will frankly scare a lot of people in my, in my, in my world as far as where, where software and, and technology are going. The, uh, this morning we talked about the Internet of Things, and under that rubric, everything becomes a sensor, uh, and everything is networked, and everything comes together, and the fact that I can network devices and sensors together allows me to be perceptive about things. Um, the Open Geospatial Consortium creates domain working groups that allows aggregated data to become real. And uh, a dozen years ago, we sat with the first responders at the Port Authority of New York and just allowed them to see in real time what was almost already available. Now you work fast forward. We now have hospitals in San Francisco that are looking at real time flooding data as a function of which manhole cover gets flooded at which time in order for the power going off at a hospital. All very knowable in real time. And what's really interesting is the physics model for rainfall rate can now be aligned with digital terrain elevation, so the first responders can make assumptions about the rain rate and what their response would be, so that they can be predictive in their analysis as to what to do. And he said, what's gotten really good? We have microclimate data. You know, universities all, particularly in Europe, universities are having these weather thons where you take a Raspberry Pi, you build a weather station, and you immediately get 100,000 uh, microclimate sensors around the city that are looking at these observations. They're all easily aggregated, pulled together, and then the algorithm says, now what I know to do. So, you know, in sitting in Annapolis, you know, my irrigation system is, is piggybacking on all my neighbors who are reporting their climate, and, and so I don't have to tell my, my system what to do, because my neighbors have all done that as a result of uh, an open standard uh, being utilized uh, in order to do the simple thing as to what I want. So I'm always learning from my teammates at NGA and been doing a lot of thinking of this question of what are our tools and what's that technology environment need, need to be. So I'm going to share some examples of a couple of things that are going on right now uh, in our experimentation and, and actually it's moving into operations. And first of all, starting with the augmentation and automation part of new tools and technologies. And I'm really seeing this as the machine almost being an extension of the human, and I'll give a practical example of that. So if I'm looking at a naval base and I see a ship there, our traditional approach is to type in through words the name of the ship, the class of the ship, and you know where, what pier it's at. Well, with machines, what we almost want to do is sort of reach out and touch that image and sort of put our finger on that ship and have it automatically fall into a database, knowing that the ship is at that location and what type of ship it is. So we've developed a tool that we call drag and drop, actually dragon as in China Dragon, right? Drag and drop tool, which essentially does that for us, right? You take your cur you, you grab an icon representing the ship and you drag it on top of that ship on the image and click and voila, into the database falls that class of ship and the location of where that ship is and the date and the time and all that kind of great stuff that comes from the metadata of the remote sense. So that's really that automation, that augmentation is an extension of the human. Go all the way to the other side of the artificial intelligence. And, and what are we imagining there? And I'll sort of give you a picture of what I think about in my head. So first of all, we'll go back to that ship, which, is, which may be part of a larger carrier group. And when it deploys with that larger carrier group, it has meaning. 
And depending upon what base it's associated with and what part of the, the Navy fleet and the military services, it has a certain purpose in life. And when it goes out to a certain deployment area, it has a very specific purpose in life. All that knowledge sits in my head. So in artificial intelligence, I envision that the machine understands that knowledge. And I almost see this web of connections, this sort of like metallic connections being occurred in this web that is just waiting for me or for a computer vision algorithm to say, the ship is here. And so as soon as that observation of the ship is here drops into this web of knowledge, it starts pinging. And all these lights go off and says, this type of deployment is happening or is likely happening, and you've been anticipating it. And so that's where I kind of see the whole artificial intelligence elucidating for me what the connections of all these observations and activities actually mean in a real world. And then I can go and ask, so who, why do I care about that? What does that mean for my customer? And that's where my cognitive mind starts to say, well, who do I need to call or who do I need to go see? And, and what other information do I need to confirm or deny that this is actually the activity? And, and who do I have to inform about this potential activity? And that's the stuff the machine won't do that I have to do, but the machine is giving me that time and space to do that more important work. And on that note, though, so now bringing in tools and capabilities that are, that are there or that are starting to become part of your traditional workflows, the, the cultural mindset or the cultural shift uh, that, that's taking place, how, how are you transforming that cultural mindset around traditional analysis that's been there, the known knowns, as you talked about, and getting analysts to embrace and trust more advanced methods to get at the unknown unknowns? So I'm convinced uh, now, having been in this job for almost three years, uh, that this is about the human mindset shift. So a couple of things, if you've read the book, The Growth Mindset, right, there's some science about understanding people recognizing I can always learn. And the opposite of that, the fixed mindset of folks saying, I only know what I know. And so what we need to do is to help our curious and innovative teammates recognize they can always learn, that they're not stuck at just what they're used to doing. And so this takes really the time and the effort in working with our team in understanding, you know, what's, what's the fear? What more do you need to help you see that there's other things that you're capable of doing that I know you're capable of doing and that we can enable you to do? So really to shift that mindset from sort of one of not really sure, never done this, and, and it's kind of outside of my experience, to one of I'm going to try it. Maybe it won't work out, but you know what? If it doesn't work out, somebody's going to help me pick me up and, and help me move on with that. And that's really creating a different sense of community and support and risk taking uh, in, in, the, in our workplace. And I see it happen all the time. Yesterday, I met with uh, four of my analysts to, who briefed me as a team. Like all four of them, they say, and, and we face each other when we do our work because we want to share and we want to learn from each other and, and grow. And, and that's such a different mindset from going to an analyst who is just focused only on their own workstation. So it's, it's really helping folks recognize that innately they have the ability to, to do more than perhaps what they thought they could. Great. So I have a St. Louis question. I think it's up here. OK, so there is a lot of energy focused on the St. Louis area growing into an even more of a geospatial center of excellence. How will this energy drive increased innovation of tools and analytics to enable mission success? I open it for the panelists. So energy attracts energy. And I, you know, I, <clears throat> I was thinking a little bit about this question earlier today. And I use the analogy of what's happening in Washington, DC around the Navy Yard area and the growth in the industry that has been spurred by the Department of Transportation and the US Navy really expanding their presence and the revitalization of the Navy Yard, and it also helps that the National Stadium is there. 
But what you see is this attraction of uh, you know, really smart people wanting to move into the area and companies opening up and moving into the area. And I see that a hundredfold happening in St. Louis. That as the, the, the companies, and, and I'm really proud of NGA and what we're doing as part of the revitalization of the, the city of St. Louis and the attraction of industry into the area. And industry will attract really smart people into the area. And really smart people also attracts universities to grow their programs in data science in the area. And it just continues to grow and grow. And, and that's what I just think is, is happening here. And I can feel it when I come to the city. Andy, can I add to, the, uh, to that? I found out when I, I, sorry, I didn't know this before I landed, but my colleague, uh, Rich Nickerson, who's sitting out there somewhere, uh, informed me that Microsoft built a um, technology center here in, in St. Louis, which um, when he told me, I was a little surprised because generally they only go in very large uh, metropolitan areas, DC, New York, Boston, um, those, those sorts of areas. So the fact that St. Louis got one um, is an incredible um, indication that Microsoft believes that there's a lot of talent and, and capability in St. Louis. So uh, if I were a student here, that would be an indication to me. Um, and if Microsoft was here, the bad guys known as Google um, <laughs> and probably Amazon, those, they're really bad. Um, they, they're, they're probably going to show up as well. You should not let them, by the way. So uh, going back on to privacy, and Jeff, a few points that you, you had hit as well. Um, so, so questions regarding privacy are just one of the ethical challenges raised by new GIS technologies. How do you negotiate the tension between ethics and innovation in the context of the private, public, private and public competition? Do you employ a professional ethicist on your inter interdisciplinary teams? Are existing codes of professional ethics sufficient? So it, it turns out I'm a big fan of Tom Sawyer because anytime you get somebody else to paint your fence, it's a good deal. <laughs> and, and so whenever we touch the internet, we have this set of sensors, as we've talked about all day, understanding what we do. And if it's convenience, I can go put a geofence uh, against the Starbucks and Starbucks can sell me something on sale that would otherwise be expired out of date by 5 o'clock this afternoon, and they can dynamically price it and target it. And a bunch of us love that convenience of, of this. So New York Times did an article that had this big separation on if you're born b before 1984, you're creeped out by this. If you're born after 1984, it's a great convenience. Uh, and, and that's around the, you know, maybe the digital native kinds of stuff. And so it's really less about ethics, but it's about norms. And when you go into any particular country or any particular culture or any particular office, you sort of see what those norms are. And um, given the state of the human condition, uh, we sort of move in the direction of convenience. And um, we as Americans will shed that privacy in favor of convenience. Um, when it crosses that imaginary line, if it's a big enough event, you know, we suspend normal rules in order to allow our government to do. So the way the Constitution is written and the way that commerce is written, we allow the internet engines to know more about us than we know about ourselves but we do not permit the government to know that. And that's just the, the construct that we have. So if something really, really bad happens, you can go ask anybody that's harvested all this data about us. And, and, and so we did a conference up at Harvard you know, a bunch of years ago to where we sort of mapped what do people know and when do they know it. And, and the big separation is we don't allow our government to predict terrorists going through the airport. But the data that's available on airport allows that to be predictable because we as a society has put a line there. Other countries, not so much. And, and, and so we'll, we'll move that line uh, in response for our recollection of why did a bunch of courageous patriots leave the UK in order to find um, America? 
and, and, and we had a new set of rules about when government could be overbearing. So the overbearing of government is a firm set of rules and, and how we're defined. Those rules don't apply to Visa and, uh, and MasterCard. And, and, and so we'll sort that, over, sort that out over time, uh, but it's the way we're governed now, and it work, works actually sort of fine. So when I think about ethics, I think about professions, the medical profession, the legal profession, that all have a code of ethics. And I feel that we're today in the process of building a profession around geospatial intelligence. I was involved many years ago in working with the US Geospatial Intelligence Foundation in establishing an accreditation program for a GeoInt certificate that academic institutions would offer. And one of the criteria in that was about ethics and having to teach about ethics. And we had quite the discussion, or I had the opportunity to have quite the discussion with the professors involved around what does that mean for geospatial intelligence. I think one of the central cores around that was the intended use of what comes out of your work or what the, how the data is applied becomes the ethical question. So it's not about the data itself, it's not about the technology itself, it's about how that is being used by, quite frankly, for the most part, humans, right, to do what with. And I think as we're really developing further in this profession, professionalizing geospatial intelligence, we'll be able to put sort of more concreteness around what is the ethics uh, in, our, in our profession. But I, I think ultimately it's gonna be something around the intended use. Great, thank you. And with that, I will, that will be our last question for the panel, but I'd like to thank each one of you for joining us this afternoon and uh, give everybody a round of applause here. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now take a 15 minute break. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the host of Government Matters, Mr. Francis Rose. Thank you very much. Here we have one more panel for you to enjoy and learn from to finish out the day. Public-private partnerships have been important in this space for a very long time, and that obviously will continue to increase, especially as the well, let's call them budget pressures, continue on the federal government. Commercialization and entrepreneurship in the geospatial ecosystem is the title of our closing panel of the day. Jason Hall, the CEO of Arch to Park, is your moderator. Please introduce him, uh, pl please welcome him. It's been a long day. And he will introduce the rest of his panel. Thank you, Francis, and uh, thanks everyone for sticking with us here for what is going to be an incredible panel on topics that have been touched on throughout the day, but uh, tackled directly now by some of the great minds involved in public-private partnerships, entrepreneurship, and innovation. So um, welcome to the stage first, Christy Monaco, Chief Ventures Officer of the NGA. Yes. We need walk-up music, I think, or like... Uh, next, uh, going in order here, we'll welcome Jim Cavanaugh, co-founder and CEO of Worldwide Technology. <laughs> next up, Dedrick Carter, Vice Chancellor for Operations and Technology Transfer, as well as a professor of engineering practice, Washington University in St. Louis. <laughs> and finally, Dr. Dwayne Smith, Provost, Harris-Stowe State University. All right, please be seated. Well, welcome, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna start here uh, with Christy. You know, a theme, and I think Stacy Dixon touched on this a bit in, uh, in her discussion, is that, you know, the, the national defense function has always pushed the boundaries of technological innovation uh, because of the nature of the problems you have to solve. You have to have an unfair advantage, um, as was said. But how that's done, particularly at the NGA, 
um, over the past few years becoming more obvious, I think under former director Robert Cardillo, um, has changed with a cultural shift and focus on external partnerships and uh, innovations to achieve your mission. Um, and your office, really exciting, is at the front lines of that cultural shift. So if you could share with us a little bit your perspective on how that's playing out from the front lines in some of the newer public-private partnerships uh, that you've structured in order to achieve that, that mission. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, first off, thanks everybody for sticking around to hear us today. That's, it's super exciting and I think it, um, it really demonstrates the, the interest that is here in, in St. Louis and Missouri and what we're doing and to have stuck around for the, the, the last panel of the day makes, makes my heart happy. There. Um, I, uh, I, I want to harken back to, I think uh, Sue Calway talked about the, you know, the six million analysts that it would take in order for us to deal with the, the huge deluge, deluge of data and information that, is, that, that we have access to these days. And uh, nobody's gonna give us those six million analysts. Like Congress is just not gonna let that happen. Um, so the way we are going to handle this is, is by finding novel applications and novel partnerships to do so. Our NGA strategy, you know, it starts out with, uh, with a goal on people and our number two uh, part of that is on partnerships. That is, partnerships are absolutely the way that we're gonna be able to continue to deliver value to the nation. Um, Public-private partnerships in particular are a, um, an interesting way for us to um, link up with uh, either uh, academic institutions or commercial enterprises or other government, uh, frankly, that allow us to um, each bring to a partnership uh, something that we are strong in and, and, and our own particular needs, and then each take away from that uh, something of value to, to each other. So um, we do things like cooperative R&D agreements. We've got, um, I, the Admiral spoke earlier this morning about our, it's cooperative R&D CRADA. Uh, so we have a CRADA with St. Louis University. We have a CRADA in the works with uh, a University of Missouri system. We've got CRADAs with lots of academic institutions around the country. And then we also do CRADAs with, um, with businesses. We do CRADAs with large businesses. We do CRADAs with small businesses. And these are opportunities for us to really burden share what can be a, a fairly expensive or, or fairly um, uh, human intensive undertaking, and that is research and development. If we can partner to, to advance our, our efforts collectively, um, or separately, that's, um, you know, that's a, of benefit. Um, one of our most exciting new things that we've done and, and what brought uh, Jason and I into contact with each other first was uh, the fact that we signed something called a partnership intermediary agreement uh, in February between the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the Missouri Technology Corporation. And this is an authority that we have as a, as a um, federal agency that allows us to partner with very specifically defined organizations. MTC happened to be one of those. And that is, that's gonna allow us to extend our reach into Missouri um, for uh, reaching into small businesses or reaching into um, uh, Missouri-based startups and, and reaching into maybe um, companies that don't even exist yet, maybe creating the opportunities through, uh, through that uh, agreement to, for new Missouri-based companies to form around um, problem sets that are, matter to NGA and for which there are also commercial applications. That's great. Well, and you've got your chairman and vice chairman of MTC here with Dedrick Carter, so we'll, uh, we'll try to make something out of that. <laughs> we like the way- you know, We have tons of ideas. <laughs> Well, you've got, that's probably a good, uh, a good segue to, uh, to Dedrick uh, on this topic. And, you know, Dedrick, you've been involved in innovation ecosystems, Boston, D.C., and, and we're very fortunate now that, that you call St. Louis home, in a wide range of both private and public uh, positions, the most important of which is the title of entrepreneur. Um, and you've always, I learned so much from you uh, on, on, on innovation ecosystems and, and love to hear your thoughts, you know, because 
over the last 12 months, St. Louis has started using the phrase, and we heard it a lot, a geospatial innovation ecosystem. And you didn't even hear that 12 months ago, uh, widely discussed. Um, and sort of what your thoughts are on that in the lessons you've seen as an entrepreneur and someone involved in leadership and in, in innovation, the lessons that we can apply and uh, the things we should be thinking about as we build this geospatial innovation ecosystem within the region. Yeah, it's a, um, <clears throat> it's a great question. Uh, I'll say it, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a sort of Gretzky quote that I like to go where the puck will be, right? And so uh, between Boston- I use that now often. Uh, there you you. I stole your line. That's a good one, right? Um, between Boston, DC and some time in London, you know, thinking about where was the technology going? I actually went to London in the early days of wireless because I thought I want to go someplace where it's going to be great and I need to understand the language. And so it was a place to split the, the difference for me. Um, if I think about the role of an entrepreneur, uh, one of the things I work with my students to understand is that an entrepreneur is someone that takes something as far as they possibly can with the least resources. Right? So your goal is to try to get inherently build in some leverage. And when you do that, you're often looking at these places where there's a corpus, there's some something there that you can have a ripple effect. And so we are blessed to have the sort of geospatial agency as one of those kind of rippling effects. And if I think about what characteristically mean, what, what are some of the characteristics of an emerging ecosystem? One of them is there is some there there. There's some ground zero force that says we, it's gonna be magnetic uh, and organic magnetic enough to sort of track, attract people from all over and, and good thoughts and good ideas and, and get people to really focus on uh, this area. Um, and yet organic enough, and if, you, if we build the right roots, that we will be able to grow some of our own. And when we can do those things in an area, then we've got the potential to have a really, truly uh, important ecosystem. About 15 years ago, I was leading a, an area at a, a large systems integration firm and the president came to me and said, we don't have the tools necessary to really quickly roll out our staff on different projects and the like. And I decided to build this thing that I call the ecosystem. Right? And the ecosystem was a, a process for figuring out what the approved tools were, getting together people who knew stuff about this, understanding who in our community was really an aficionado there, and then thinking about what was on the radar. And the ecosystem built up to this point where it became an everyday tool in the what is now a two, three billion dollar company. Uh, and I get excited when I talk about that. It got to be so successful that people started to supplement it for everyday planning and the like. And the e ecosystem got to be this really heavy tool that never, that started to not be as agile as, as it was supposed to be. So one of the characteristics and lessons that I'll, I'll share with you is that as we're building this ecosystem, we don't want to lose our agility. We don't want to lose our ability to sort of not only move at a move at a pace, but also sense out what's happening a few stages out. And that's why public-private partnerships are important, because the, the, the government is there to help uh, consistently push the boundary of knowledge, but you're passing off some of that opportunity share, I'd say, to a set of entrepreneurs whose job it is to be hungry and to go as far as they can with the fewest resources possible. That makes, uh, makes great sense, thank you. I wanna, um, uh, Dwayne, a question for you. You know, as we, we think through innovation and, and building an innovation ecosystem around geospatial and, and more broadly, it's well documented that innovation thrives best um, when it's led by diverse talent and, and minds. And in order uh, for the geospatial innovation ecosystem to reach its full potential here uh, and around the country, it seems to me it needs to become more diverse and inclusive, particularly um, uh, for African Americans. And Harris Stowe State University um, is a national leader in graduating African American scientists, including being the number one university in the state. Uh, for those with math and statistics degrees and a yeah. top 50 national university. Um, so this is very impressive. And you're doing a lot of work with the National Science Foundation in that area. So what are you seeing, uh, you know, as you lead this work that we need to be thinking about and what we can do to make sure that this is an inclusive, e in inclusive innovation ecosystem that really reaches its full potential? 
Sure. That is a great question and an important question. So I always start by giving a historical context of Harris Stowe State University. Most people think of us as a teacher's college, and actually we were founded in 1857 as the first normal school. Normal schools were teaching institutions west of the Mississippi. But what's interesting about that, it was founded for white women. And the first white female graduate, a white woman graduated from college in 1840. So we were founded 17 years after uh, the laws were changed that women could be educated. That was Harris. And Stowe was founded in 1890 for African American women, about 30 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, which outlawed uh, slavery. So basically, our founding as Harris and Stowe were kind of this, it was, start, it was founded on diversity. Yeah. And we, these two institutions coexisted side by side until 1954. And that's the Brown decision that outlawed legalized segregation. So most people think about segregation uh, or, or the desegregation of schools from the K through 12, but Harris and Stowe were some of, one of the few schools that actually desegregated as a result of the Brown Decree of 54. And so we moved through this uh, ecosystem, uh, region and also nationally in educating diverse populations. So here we are in 2019, and here we are in St. Louis, in which you will find less than 5% of all African Americans in the region possess a master's degree. And St. Louis is ranked top 25 in a nation in African American population. Only about 10% of African Americans in the, in the region possess a baccalaureate degree. So the, the issues are very acute. And so Harris Stowe is one of the smallest public institutions, but about four of our degree programs are ranked top, in the top 100 in the nation in graduating African Americans. In one year alone, Harris Stowe graduated more African American females, women, than about eight public schools combined in one year. So we pack a wallet, but we look at this ecosystem in terms of STEM, and even though we're known, we start off as education, but we graduate more African Americans in mathematics, more African Americans in biological sciences, and our, and our partnerships uh, are vast. And so our goal is to be more competitive, but also partner with other institutions. So our funding comes from various sources, but the one that I'm, I, I will leave with is the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation grant. And Dedrick, he's, that's, he's a, one of our co-PIs on this grant. But the goal is to have this aggressive push to graduate underrepresented groups in the state of Missouri. And that includes African Americans, Hispanics, Native American, Pacific, Pacific Islanders. And so it's ambitious. So combine these institutions, Washington University, University of Missouri, St. Louis, University of Missouri, Columbia, Truman State University, University of Central Missouri, Missouri State University, Lincoln University, and the University, the, the St. Louis Community Colleges. So combined, these institutions produce about 70% of all underrepresented groups that earn STEM degrees. But there's only 278 graduates. 70% in the state, but only 278. So our goal is to graduate by 2022 over 600 a year increased by 125%. And so uh, I would say in order for us to push forward to make a difference in this ecosystem, you must have vision. And I would say that the people that we surround ourselves with have vision. I have a, a special kinship with NGA because I actually started my first job when it was Defense Mapping Agency Aerospace Center. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. Everyone just aged themselves in the room. All right. <laughs> We called it DMAC, <laughs> and it was on 2nd and North, the location A900, and it really transformed me as a West Side kid from St. Louis and, and the opportunities I had at, at um, NGA, and so I feel that we could do the same thing, and I believe that Harris Stowe can play a pivotal role in that. Yeah. No, uh, you've done incredible, and you were just, uh, you had a major event uh, around STEM last week with uh, the NSF. 
Sure. We had a, a conference on advancing the agenda for African Americans in STEM, and the goal is to get more African Americans in, in this STEM ecosystem. Yeah. That's awesome. Can, Congratulations. Can just, on, let me just uh, say one quick thing in addition to that. And because the point of, if we look at the word ecosystem, ecosystem is really about uh, components coming together in balance. And in any community, there's growth and there's equity. And if you have great growth without equity, there's a dysfunction in community. And so in the, at the point I talked earlier about the ecosystem and having something that's, a, that's a, the focus, focal point, if you don't find ways, avenues, inroads, to couple in um, those who are disconnected from that community, you're going to have great growth and you're going to deepen your dysfunction in community. That's right. So one of the greatest ways to find uh, your way out of a, a bad situation, I think, is education in some ways, but more importantly, education in the STEM disciplines. Uh, and if you look at what the opportunity is around a, a geospatial ecosystem in the St. Louis region, and you look at the population, and you look at some of our historical issues and problems here, we have no choice but to say, how do we build an ecosystem that is as inclusive as possible in order for us to continue to, as a region, benefit from the true ecosystem sense of what the potential is. That's right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I know because we've right. talked a lot today about the need to attract uh, talent, and while I was playing on my Twitter over there, it's also about investing in our existing residents so that the economic benefits of this growing cluster are shared more broadly and equitably uh, than have been done in the past. And I hope that can be a key differentiator in this industry. Um, well, Jim, I want to uh, turn to you. You know, we talk about uh, startups and innovators, and you started a little company, um, co-founded a little company uh, back in 1990, homegrown here in St. Louis. And I, th I think according to the most recent reports, you are now over $10 billion in revenue, which is just yep. extraordinary. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, I, I was on a panel last week with some startup CEOs and, and uh, two large company CEOs, Andy Taylor from Enterprise Holdings and Sue McCollum from Major Brands, and they said, you know, you never really stop being a startup because as soon as you do, you get taken over by the competition. So as you look back now um, with Worldwide, how are you doing that today, particularly um, around the geospatial industry, which is impacting so many other sectors that, that you participate in, in helping your customers innovate to solve their most cutting edge problems? Yeah, uh, so no, it's great to be here, being a graduate of St. Louis University. I will uh, tell you I never expected to be up here running a $10 billion <laughs> company. Well, we're actually $11.5 billion, so. Uh, it's been so, an hour. Yep. Hey, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of exponential things happening, but that didn't just happen. So, uh, but, it's, but it is great to be up here and listen to everybody talk about uh, ecosystems and different kinds of ecosystems. So, and I would also think about uh, just having the mindset. We talked a little bit about culture earlier in the, the earlier panel about creating these ecosystems how important it is here in St. Louis to do certain things, to connect business with, with education, uh, with technology, with, with, with government. Uh, and I look at it today, there's so many things happening, one in St. Louis, it does require an ecosystem of things. So to create a community, a real positive community, it requires people to come together in different businesses and universities and, and government to come together and work together in a collaborative, uh, synergistic way that potentially can create a multiplier effect of, of good things. And it's just like when you create good behaviors within a company and you train good behaviors, you can create a culture that becomes very contagious. And that contagious kind of behavior, not only for worldwide, happens here in St. Louis, but it happens in all of our offices around the United States and in Singapore and London and Amsterdam and everywhere around the world where we have our employees because we, we, we look to create this, this, this ecosystem of doing the right thing, of creating the right behavior. So the same thing from my perspective applies when you're building a technology platform. 
And so we, we have evolved as an organization, worldwide technology, you know, what we were back in 1999, or 1990, and what we were in 99, and what we were in 2009 is very different than what we are today. And we have had to reinvent ourselves and continue to push ourselves. And we were talking a little bit earlier about innovation and about, you know, how do you, how do you stay competitive and how do you create an environment that is a winning environment, but it's also it, it drives the right behavior. You're doing the right things. And I think you can do both. Uh, but at times, you need to be willing to disrupt yourself. And at times, it's not just about doing things more efficiently, because sometimes you can look at things and say, yeah, we need to do that more efficiently. Well, sometimes you may say, we, need, we may not, maybe we shouldn't be doing that at all. You talked about sometimes there's some competitive disadvantages, maybe that the federal government has, our federal government, because of the FAR, uh, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, and maybe some other countries don't have those things. So sometimes, you know, I'm not saying to eliminate the FAR, that's not what I'm saying, <laughs> but, but I am saying sometimes you need to think differently. And, and I know, and, and it's a little bit to the point, uh, like the NGA and like a lot of the three-letter agencies out there today, uh, they need to move quickly. And this is where I say worldwide technology has created an innovation ecosystem internally that runs on what we call as our platform or advanced technology platform. So we've kind of branded ourselves at Worldwide as Silicon Valley in St. Louis. And the reason that we say that is that we bring all of these innovative companies, the mainstream tier ones, it could be Microsoft, Cisco, Hewlett Packard, you know, it, the big Amazon, the big, the big global cloud players, all the way into, you know, we were talking right before we came up here, I'm an investor in a company called Provoro that's an early stage security company out in Phoenix, uh, the NGA is looking at some of these companies. Uh, there's, so we have these very early stage, leading edge, bleeding edge companies in our advanced technology innovation ecosystem labs here in St. Louis. But the way that we have designed and looked at it is for us to be competitive, we need to be able to help, one, understand what the problems are of our customers and how do we help solve the problems. So one of the challenges that I believe our customers have is that they, have, they are being barraged with new technology and it's coming at them faster and faster and faster. And it's harder and harder to determine what, what's real and what's not real. So we've decided that we're gonna build these very sophisticated labs that will help them evaluate that technology in a real-time basis and not just give them a white paper, but literally create environments that they can test, build, break in our labs and not in their production environments to actually make faster, smarter, more intelligent decisions. But we've built that based on a technology platform that you can get to anytime, any place, anywhere in the world. And we're also using that platform not just for our customers to be able to test and evaluate product and platforms, but we're using that as an environment for our engineers, our customers, and our partners engineers and actually high school kids, and we're looking at moving into universities to create this platform, this innovation platform where they can get in and they can do testing on hardware and software and actually create development sites. So we have things today, and it's, we talked earlier about we're moving down this, this kind of this road of building out this e innovation ecosystem platform that we are working very collaborative with our very collaboratively with our customers, both in the federal space, the three-letter agencies, also in a commercial space and large service providers out there like the telcos and the web 2.0. So, so very excited about what I believe an ecosystem and how an ecosystem can positively impact where you're going as a business, but also how by building out and creating an ecosystem in your local community that can actually be a multiplier of good things, of good behaviors, and of ac economic activity. So that's the way we look at it. How can you do that using kind of this platform, this ecosystem, uh, as a positive enabler for your business, but also for your community? Well, that's very insightful. I 
appreciate that. What well, you know, D Dedrick, you were uh, uh, sort of nodding to that as well, and Dwayne, I'd ask you, you know, is you hear the way that industry is approaching that. Um, what can industry better do to partner um, with the higher education institutions here? Sometimes there's a disconnect, you know, it's like if only industry was doing this or only if higher education was doing that. As you hear that, that approach, um, what could industry be doing to partner better and harness those capabilities in the competitive edge uh, that our higher education institutions can help them? You know, um, higher education institutions are great at bringing very bright people together for a two, four, six, eight multiples of those years um, who love to dig in and solve problems, right? Um, the challenge is sometimes finding the problems. And often industry is a source of very relevant problems. And when you get those two folks in a room, and certainly industry has solutions to those problems, but if you, if you get those folks in a room, those who are willing to not just look at the the short five or 10 year horizon, but ones who are saying, oh yeah, that's really interesting. But if we think about the way the molecules come together on and we, and we look at this test tube, we might be able to solve this in 10 or 15 years. Those different time horizons coming together create this sort of hot and cold front that is the cyclone, right? Innovation is when one finds economic, strategic, or societal value in fundamental knowledge. Yeah. Government often is the, the major purveyor of supporting the development of fundamental knowledge. And then we have to think about how we partner with industry and otherwise to take that fundamental knowledge and to turn it into something that's useful, that's commercializable, that is the startup. Right? When I was with the National Science Foundation as a, the, the chief of staff there, I started this program called Innovation Core. And I remember trying to push hard to say we've got $7 billion uh, in industry. And I actually equate a lot of NSF to very much to higher education. We've got $7 billion of research and we should see more companies than we have coming out of that research. Not all, but more companies coming out. When we did this, I had folks on the Hill that said, you know, if you do this, you'll go to jail. I went to the general counsel and said, I don't think I look good in stripes, though the tie's okay, I think. I don't think I look that great in stripes. We need to come up with a system that helps us to be able to think about how. And ultimately it was, we have to have a public-private partnership. There are things that government and agencies, the three letters and otherwise, do really well. And there are things that the market economy knows how to do really well. And if we let us do the things we do really well in concert with collaboration, then, then we get the best. That's, that's what leverage is all about. Yep. So I do believe that it, it, it really is about having good conversations about what the real, true, significant problems are and orienting some of that thought, those thought cycles towards addressing those problems. So, so I answer this question by personalizing it and kind of going back to my experiences at uh, NGA. Uh, I started there in a sophomore, as a sophomore in high school. Wow. And it was some type of program, I guess, to get disadvantaged kids off the streets or whatever. But um, I worked in the photolithographic division. I didn't even know what that was at the time, but I felt very comfortable uh, in that space. And I actually worked at NGA or DMAC from my sophomore year in high school up until my college senior year. And as I gained experiences and skill sets, I just moved up the ranks. So what does that mean? That means that we have to start very early. And what I find that with many companies and organizations that, for example, that could come to Harris still trying to recruit our students, they want seniors. And the issues that we have here is that many of our students, I'm not just talking about African-American students, they're not really uh, perhaps maybe engaged. They may not have all the skill sets. So if you look at uh, kind of globally where we are as a country, so the Pew Research Foundation, their latest uh, rankings of, 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 of countries that are proficient in mathematics, uh, reading, science, uh, the United States ranks like 38 in the country, in, in the world. 38, 19th and other areas. So we're not top 10. So we're moving these students to the pipeline and the fortunate ones are getting higher education, as I said before, uh, in the St. Louis region, only about 10% um, about of African Americans go on to earn a baccalaureate degree. But many of these students are um, underprepared for the rigors of university life. 
So what can we do earlier? We can start earlier. We can start in their freshman year in, in, in different types of activities, whether it be externships, internships. But by the time you get into that senior year, you have a, a more of a, a, a larger group of individuals to choose from. So at Harris Stowe, we start off, particularly our STEM students, they are doing undergraduate research after their very first year. And then they climb the ladder. So by the time they're in their senior year, they're doing some really strong work. And then they will be um, competitive at different companies. So I would just say the takeaway would be that we need to start early in connecting students to companies. Now that, that makes sense. Let's look at it from the, the other side then, Jim, on, on industry or, or Christy from the, the public sector side. Um, and this is particularly interesting for industry because yesterday, I thought it was very eye-opening on, on, on a partnership when Michael Nydorf announced the $100 million partnership between Centene and Washington University Medical School to solve some of these chronic illness problems um, in really a, a big, bold, nationally significant um, public-private partnership. But how are you seeing that as industry? What, what else can universities do to help solve some of those uh, disconnects where they might occur or a public-private partnership um, or and Christy as well from the public sector side, that universities need to hear, you know, what, what, uh, while yeah, we're all here on stage. I, I don't, I, you know, I'm sure, you know, you, you think about this all the time, and, and I, you know, I'm on the board of trustees at St. Louis University. Um, you know, I, I do think we just need to continue to think about uh, how you bring kids, you know, into the university, and, and you're training them, I think, on the earlier panel, and I completely agree how to think. You know, you're looking for not only people that have or kids that have specialized degrees, but you're looking for individuals of certain characteristics. You know, how, how, how ambitious are they? What's their work ethic? How do they think? Are they, are they in a, you know, inquisitive? Do they really have that ability to go out and solve problems? But at the same time, uh, you also want to I think we need to try to do a better job of blending. How do we also train them on skills that, if I could put it this way, they can hit the ground running you know, when they come out of college. So if it's being an engineer or a software developer, getting them hands-on and actually getting them in labs and, and training them to do different things. And I think a part of it is some of the internships that you make those connections uh, to, to industry, whether it's uh, you know, the NGA or its worldwide technology or other great good companies, great companies that are around. So, so I think continuing to, for us to collaborate and, and think about how do we make those connections to education, but then also a practical approach of when they come out, they're actually employable, you know, uh, and, and they can actually make an impact and, and a different, and because at the end of the day, that's what's going to, allow them to make that transition into a company faster. So I think it's something that, that I think we can all think about. How, how do we do that a little bit better than what we're doing today? That's excellent. Christy. I, I think um, I, am, I am so impressed by the, by the talent and the programs that are coming out of universities these days and even high schools. Um, I, I went to high school in Daytona Beach, Florida not really a bastion of intellectual greatness. <laughs> but I was recently, for random reasons, looking at the advanced placement programs that are being offered at the high school I went to, and I literally jumped up and down when I saw that my high school, a block off the beach, was is now offering AP Human Geography. And I was like, that is amazing. Um, students that are coming out of, out of academic programs these days, I, I would never be able to get a job. I, I came out of, of college with a double major, and I was fancy. Um, so I, I think our academic institutions are doing a great job of, of applying really um, modern applications of what, is it, what does it mean to be in college and, um, and train, prepare a, 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 an adult um, to 
you know, for life after school. I, I, I could not say um, any, any better things about, just generally speaking, what, it, what is coming out these days. Um, there are some really interesting programs that a lot of universities around the nation are taking part in, things like Hacking for Defense, which, are, um, which is a, a specific curriculum that was originated at Stanford and has now moved to a number of other universities around the nation, where um, they work with the Defense Department, they work with the intelligence community, and what we do on our side is say, it, getting back to that, what are our problems? What are the what are our needs? Where we can can um, lob at them. Hey, here's a hard problem we're trying to solve, and then they put these students through these um, kind of entrepreneurial programs to help them solve, come up with ways to solve those challenges. Um, there have been a number of companies that we now do business with at NGA that that resulted from programs like this. So. Um, uh, you know, those sorts of, of ways of, of us reaching out to you, you, you reaching out to us, and just maintaining and you know, doing things like this where we kind of keep each other in the forefront of our mind as being, hey, you know what, my, my reach at NGA is much broader than the people I can sort of look at every, on an everyday basis. And I, those are the types of things that I think we, we need to continue to push to collectively do. You know, I just got an email from uh, our, an actual letter from uh, a parent of a hackathon that we did for high school. And the, 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 the letter was just glowing that it literally changed the direction of that student in regards to what they're doing and where they're going relative to the finishing out their high school career and, and what they're looking at for college. So I think those types of things that we can, we can help each other connect the dots for some of those students to give them real life kind of views into to what STEM is all about. Uh, you know, I, I think would just be very, very positive. And I think for St. Louis, it would be a great thing, you know, if yeah, we, we yeah, could do yeah. that. I pull one more kernel out of this and that is, um, so I absolutely agree that we need early exposure for our students. They need to see real world problems. So industry brings the problems, the higher ed often brings the solutions. We need risk capital, we need good favorable conditions around policies and collaboration agreements. Uh, but we, we also need to be sort of in the face of our students earlier. And I mean this in a very, a way to say, let's not say here's a small problem, you solve it, and you will pat you on the back and make you feel good. We've got to find ways to to encourage our students to, to go after, pursue problems that are worthy of their time. One of the, the challenges I see is that students tend to often take the easy route um, because it is, I do this and I smile and I'm not great and I, meet, I met the criteria. And I think what I push our students to do is to say, train yourself to be retrainable, right? And get in front of a problem and everything that you learn, the first day of a good buddy of mine who was just acquired by uh, Twitter not so long ago says, when I get my computer scientist uh, from Washington University or insert your favorite university here, I have to spend X amount of dollars retraining them. They're really smart, but they don't know anything about software development, right? So I have to teach them what it is to really do enterprise scale software development. And I think the earlier we can help people understand that they're learning something, but they don't know anything, and that you need to find problems that are worthy of your time, the better we will be at sort of bridging the gap between theory and practice and actually really truly moving the needle. That's, that's uh, well, mindful of time, I do know there was one question um, uh, on the app that I'll give some credit to because it was the first question, and I apologize for any others. And it's sort of the geospatial question around uh, St. Louis right now, Jim, and it was directed to you, uh, perhaps slightly off topic, but um, you and Carolyn Kendall Betts are leading the charge to bring a major league soccer expansion team. So the question, of course, was, you know, when is MLS going to make the location decision, uh, which we all know they need to make, which is to come to St. Louis. Um, anything you can share for the audience question on uh, status of the MLS effort you're leading with? Yes, I'm going to need a lot of help from all your anal analysts out here to figure out to make sure we can pack the stadium and we connect to all of our, our fans out there. But uh, now I, I say this on a, you know, a little bit of a, a, a joking note there, but, uh, you know, it kind of comes back to things I, I look at. Uh, you talked about 
uh, connecting to students and 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 what really drives a student. You know, it's just amazing sometimes when you you connect the dots and you find the student that literally connects it to something that they're passionate about. It's amazing. You know, the the you know they don't just do something to get it done. They're 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 like passionate. I want to go work. I I, I want to make an impact. Uh, so. I think you know when we talk about an ecosystem. I'm coming to the to the whole soccer thing, to create uh, an incredible ecosystem uh, here in St. Louis. It's all of us coming together, and I'm passionate about the game of soccer. Fortunately, uh, my dad my dad was a bricklayer. Uh, I played soccer, got a scholarship at St. Louis University. I'd probably end up in construction, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I probably wouldn't have gone to college if it wasn't for soccer. So I'm very passionate about the game of soccer. I think the game of soccer is part of an ecosystem. I look at the ecosystem and even connecting into inner city schools, it can drive the right behavior at young ages just in regards to create, create good habits for kids, discipline, work ethic. Uh, but I think also sport coming up when I look at MLS, it is a huge following by the millennials. It is the sport that has the largest following of millennials. And if we're looking at our community with the great things that the NGA is doing, there's over $8 billion of construction that's going on downtown city St. Louis and Midtown. You know, part of this is connecting to those millennials at the universities that are going to sporting events. And it's all about connecting the dots and creating this ecosystem of energy and economic activity that also includes sport. So I, I believe this is a, it's, it's not the end all for St. Louis, but I do believe it's a very important piece. And I just so happen to love the game of soccer, so uh, that's not bad also. So uh, anyway, for those of you that uh, support it, I, I really appreciate all your support and uh, we look forward to it. And it's not gonna be that far from uh, from NGA, you know, I think the stadium will be down there. We haven't been able to disclose a specific uh, stadium renderings and all that, but I think it would be absolutely cool to be next to Union Station. You have NGA and you have all the great things. You have St. Louis University, Harris Stowe, Wash U, uh, just so many great things going on there. So I'm, hope, I'm very hopeful we'll make it happen. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. So join me uh, one last time to... Uh, Can I interrupt for one second? Because I'd really we, like to give away some part of a million dollars. Okay, let's do it. Okay. So, Stacy spoke about uh, prize challenges. And I want to make sure, I really want to want to get the word out about a prize challenge that NGA is currently co-sponsoring with NASA. And uh, through mid-May, it's a $1.2 million prize pot. And it's called MagQuest, www.magquest.com. I advise you to Google that rather than put it in your browser, because if you type in MagQuest, it takes you to MapQuest, which is nice. We like maps. Um, but what we're looking for are basically new methods of magnetic data collection. And basically, anybody in this room can enter and get, get, to be, get, get a part of that prize. So please. I would personally love it to see lots of St. Louis uh, uh, folks take home some of that prize money, if not all of it. That sounds good. Well, thank you for that challenge on both fronts. Um, and join me in giving one last round of applause to this incredible panel. You almost made it. Almost made it. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce for the closing remarks uh, for this event today, the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Vice Admiral Robert Sharp. So I, 
I got to tell you, I was, uh, I was pretty excited coming here um, to the point where I had a hard time sleeping last night until, uh, until I watched UVA cap capture the NCAA championship. And my daughter is a UVA graduate, so I feel I own stock. And it's been a long time coming. Um, it was a great game, great tournament. Um, but I had high expectations coming here, and I got to tell you, that's always dangerous because when you hype something up, you know, it's never quite what you're anticipating. But in this case, uh, this, this far exceeded uh, my anticipation, my expectations. And I just, as I was sitting here listening to speaker after speaker, panel after panel, I was just thinking, wow. You know, this, uh, and it was, it was echoed by people in here, just wow, you know, what is going on here? Not only what we're doing now, but the art of the possible, you know, the, and the enthusiasm. And I was really excited that a lot of the discussion, this is a pretty, uh, this, this crowd, uh, you know, knows science, knows technology, but I was really encouraged that a lot of the discussion really focused once again on people and partnerships. And you heard me talk about that. That's uh, goal number one for National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's strategic goals. Our vision focuses on people and partnerships. And I could not be happier to, you know, with this sort of discussion that was going on in here today. Uh, a, a couple other things, uh, you know, that were rolling through my mind here. Uh, going back to the soccer team, I got to tell you, any soccer team would be fortunate to, to make this their home. Yeah. Uh, this, this city, this region uh, really embraces their sporting teams and they come out and they're loyal, loyal fans, you know, and, and that does it, and it's not based off of that team excelling. As a matter of fact, when the team's having troubles, this is the sort of uh, city and region that really embraces them and comes out. And uh, you see it with all the teams that they've been here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit a ball game, I think, Wednesday. And uh, I've been to the park here. I was welcomed when I came to the park. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not a Chicago Cubs fan, although my uh, great uncle pitched for the Cubbies. I, I got to admit to you, I'm a San Francisco Giants fan because I grew up in the Bay Area. But my second favorite team is anybody who's playing the Los Angeles Dodgers. <laughs> um, so it's just, we didn't, we didn't uh, plan this out in advance, but it, it turned out uh, to my benefit. So I'm looking forward to that. I want to uh, end here by thanking some of the folks uh, who, who managed to put this together. You know, you come here and it looks real smooth. You know, it looks like a duck floating right across the water. But down underneath that water, there are feet just like crushing you know, and, and uh, adapting to changes as they come up. Um, so if, if you were involved in making the magic happen today, you know, in, in whatever small way, organizing, getting people where they need to go on time, uh, the sound system, the, uh, the videographers, the photographers, please stand up and be recognized. Just, just a spectacular, spectacular event, and I'm hoping uh, this is uh, the first of, of many to come into the future. Um, I also want to thank St. Louis University for their partnership, and specifically uh, uh, Dr. Pastello, the president here, and the uh, men and women of St. Louis University and the students that took the time to be here. So how about a round of applause for St. Louis University? and Arch to Park, um, a, passion, a group of passionate individuals who really want to make a difference in this city, and they were instrumental in, in putting this specific event together. Um, so a round of applause for Arch to Park for your leadership. And then just in case uh, uh, you're feeling left out, you know, I challenged everybody today to uh, be polite, be participatory, uh, make this a value for you. So if you're feeling left out, uh, I want to thank everybody. Um, I want to thank you all for, for taking the time to be here. Hopefully you found this of value to you. You know, I'm, I'm not a believer in meetings 
uh, just for meetings. You know, at the end of it, I'll, I always think, was that good? Was that uh, time well spent? Uh, was it of value to us? I personally found this day tremendously valuable to me. So how about a round of applause for everybody who's, who's uh, been here with us today? And then, uh, Francis, if we could have you up here. I, I got to tell you, it's not easy to, to keep these things running on time, on target. And Francis Rose, you just did a tremendous job, not only as a moderator uh, throughout the day, but also running some of our panels. And uh, you know, you, every, everything was in, uh, fast, tight, it was enjoyable. And we just want to give you this small token of our appreciation to remember the 21st century geospatial ecosystem and your participation in that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You very kind, Admiral. Appreciate it. And then, uh, those of you who know me, uh, you know, I've been 30 years in the United States Navy, a uh, member of the intelligence community at that time. Thank you. Um, and I grew up uh, deploying on aircraft carriers and briefing naval aviators. And one thing I found early on is that uh, naval aviators like movies. Um, they like movies. Uh, when I first came in the Navy, uh, we didn't have the, uh, the interweb thing. Uh, we didn't have the connectivity out to the ships, and we actually sat in, in, in uh, uh, ready rooms and, and to entertain ourselves on deployment. We'd watch movies together. And, and uh, I think I might have a small clip here uh, just to entertain us a little bit and to get us thinking about um, today and tomorrow, if I could tee that up. This is how people do it now, Nikki. They have their interviews oh, on the internet. I like it. I know. Okay, here they, they are. The and when I hit this, yeah, they'll be able to straight, see us. So come on and get in here close so we can be seen in the webcam. See how small the webcam is? No, get you, Kachi. Nick, come here, but don't crown me. We can see you guys. Okay, good. You got it. Hi, my name is Billy. We can hear you fine as well. Oh, great. Good. Billy McMahon. Nick Campbell. I'm Benjamin. Allison. We're going to ask you a few questions that some of our candidates find a little bit odd. Let's go. No judgment. Shoot. You're shrunken down to the size of nickels and dropped to the bottom of a blender. What do you do? You take her flat on your right, back right, like right. this. You just lay back and enjoy that breeze. Floor, Pretend it's a fan. And let the those okay, bad legs whip all around yeah. you like this. It's like getting an MRI. Once this blender's on, it's on forever. It's on. Respectfully, I got to disagree. We sold blenders, and even the best model in the world is only going to run maybe 10 or 11 hours. So we're getting out, and when we do, we're better off for it because whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's not so much getting out of the blender it's what happens next that's the question you've got two nickel sized men free in the world think of the possibilities i mean i i'm top of my head and i'm just my head's here. swimming sunglass repair we'd yeah, be hell yeah, on those little the screws little, maybe stick us in those submarines that they put in people's bodies to fight diseases okay yeah. you, that's that's not a real thing the submarines no. wait a minute i thought we were stuck in a blender now we're saving lives what uh, what, what? 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 Let me just recap this for you real quick. We started off in a blender. Yeah. Now we're saving lives. What? 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 Wait a minute. We were stuck in a blender. <laughs> and now we're saving lives? What? You guys led us to this. Thank you. All right. Hey, uh, I, I played that video because uh, I enjoy it, for one thing. <laughs> and uh, there's nothing wrong with having a little fun, you know, during our day. In our time here together, but really, you know, the, it's it's really deep, uh, kind of. Um, but it's it's not about getting out of the blender. It's about what happens next, right? And that's what excites me about this group. It's it's not the day we spent here, but hopefully you made some connections, you exchanged some contact information. You're thinking about uh, growing this ecosystem, about how you can contribute it, to it. You know, and it is those people and those partnerships that are going to make us successful. Um, certainly successful for NGA as, a, as an agency, but I think successful for this community, success uh, for this nation, and it's necessary. So it's not about getting out of the blender. It's about what happens next. I look forward to, to what we do together. And with that, I'd like to bring up Mr. Jeff Harris for one small announcement. Please. Thank you. Uh, what we've seen here today is it's all about community. And when we convene a community together of government, 
industry, academia, there's almost nothing that happens. And, and so this GON thing's been going on since about 2003, and uh, the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation is an educational foundation that was focused on the tradecraft of getting the community of interest together to solve tough problems. Uh, Stacy, you said a very nice agenda of tough problems. Um, uh, Christy and Stacy dangled some money. <laughs> um, Bob and I talked a lot about we're driven by mission. And when we're driven by mission, we're developing tradecraft, we like to hang with the cool kids. And the cool kids are all over the country, but we get together to network and exchange ideas. And since 2003, the GeoInt Symposium has evolved to where we get together between four and 5,000 people uh, every year. And we will celebrate our community in San Antonio the first week of June this year. And in 1,503 days, we will be here in St. Louis on May 21st, 2023, for GeoInt to be here in St. Louis. And we look forward to rocking with the cool kids in St. Louis. Awesome. So GeoInt Symposium this year down in, in uh, San Antonio, uh, St. Louis is coming down, Mayor's coming down herself, uh, to, to, uh, there's going to be a booth set up just talking about St. Louis and the great things we have coming, uh, going on in this city. Um, once again, high expectations far exceeded those. Uh, I look forward to the great things we collectively do uh, together on behalf of this nation. Thank you and God bless.